start? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you all for coming back. It's uh, great to see you all again uh, for this uh, last meeting uh, in, in this course, which will be uh, divided into two parts. And there will be two songs also uh, that, uh, that, that uh, we will listen to uh, uh, to help me maybe uh, deliver a couple of ideas. Um, the first part will be about the peace process, the Palestinian-Israeli peace process framework and um, the way it has dealt so far with forced displacement. And the second one will be more about the different, uh, um, let's say, legal remedies that would be uh, expected. But I would like also to discuss with you, hear from you, um, what you think. So I will try not to talk too much uh, at the end. I know that I've prepared some slides, and I do tend to talk too much. But I'll try this time to, uh, um, to make sure that there will be also time for us to discuss uh, certain ideas. So let's start by the peace process first, before we uh, uh, st st stop at, uh, at the break time. Um, the peace process, uh, who thinks it's a successful peace process so far? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good start. <laughs> I know that uh, you all agree with me that it hasn't really uh, brought fruits. And uh, with this presentation, I'm going to go a little bit in more detail and in more uh, specialization on the way it dealt with the different waves of forced displacement that we talked about before. Or that way sometimes it refrained from dealing with waves of displacement that we talked about before. Um, but it's important to first uh, put the framework of the peace process. What is this, you know, where does it come from? Um, the, first, the first and most important <coughs> and the source of the framework that we are living in today starts in 1987 with the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel. Um, and you would assume, you know, you would, you, usually one would think, how is the Camp David uh, uh, relevant to the Palestinian Israeli conflict? Isn't that a treaty between Egypt and Israel? Well, no, it's very, very relevant. We are actually living and experiencing the things that the Camp David uh, Accords stipulated. Because the Camp David Accords consisted of two elements. One of them is the framework for conclusion of a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. So this is the actual uh, treaty that Egypt and Israel regulated their future relationship and the, they uh, basically uh, that was the peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. And the other one was called the Framework for Peace in the Middle East. Right? So it wasn't actually for Egypt, although Egypt and Israel signed them, but for some reason they signed them in order to guide the rest of the Middle East how to do. It's quite, it's quite surprising. Usually, in international law, one state cannot create obligations for others and cannot suggest <laughs> obligations for others but this happened in the Egyptian-Israeli peace agreement. Um, in, uh, in the introduction, even, of this uh, agreement, of the, of the framework for peace in the, of the Middle East, uh, it was written that uh, Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat, President of Arab Republic of Egypt, and Menachem Begin, Prime Minister of Israel, met with Jimmy Carter, President of the United States, at the Camp David from September, blah, 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 and have agreed on the following framework for the peace for peace in the Middle East, they invite other parties of the Arab-Israeli conflict to adhere to it. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> the text, to adhere what to what it. What does it mean to adhere? Uh, exactly. <laughs> to adhere. What does it mean in English? To, to adhere. Stick to, to stick to it. Yeah. You just follow. To abide by. You abide by, you adhere. It's quite a strong term to be put in a peace agreement in order to invite others to join, actually. But this was the term that was used in 1987. And why, uh, why it's written 1978? Yeah, it, it, it is 78, I apologize. Not 80, it's 78. Um, um, and what, 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 did, what was the most important element of this? Well, it was that Egypt 
Jordan and representatives of the Palestinian people shall agree on establishing a self-government in the West Bank and Gaza. So this is the framework for peace that was suggested already in 1987, 78, Arabic, because in Arabic, you say so it, uh, it's always, uh, anyway, uh, so in, uh, in, in 78, um, it was already decided that there will be a Palestinian autonomy, uh, that this is the way to reach a peace, peace in the Middle East. And already it was discussed and agreed that this autonomy will be for five years, during which the permanent status uh, situation will be negotiated. <coughs> so all that the PLO had to do later was just to actually adhere to this agreement and enter into an agreement that follows these principles. It actually, you feel from already this agreement uh, that the PLO maybe did not really exercise a negotiation when it entered this agreement. It simply joined somehow or... Um, so in, uh, in, in, in 1993 and 1994, there were two other important uh, agreements. One of them was between the PLO uh, and Israel. It was called the Declaration of Principles on Interim Self-Government, TOP. The other one is called the Treaty between, uh, of Peace between Israel and Jordan. These are the two other peace treaties that have been signed uh, and the two peace tracks that have been activated since Camp David. Obviously, we all know that the Syrian track of peace did not, uh, did not work until today. Um, but these are the two tracks that have actually uh, worked. Uh, worked with, with the two uh, uh, quotation signs. So how the question is how did these... Uh, uh, first, it's important to remind that what the Declaration of Principles did was that it introduced a Palestinian autonomous uh, system, uh, a Palestinian authority, in parts of the occupied territory, in parts of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, um, and give this uh, uh, authority, limited authority in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So not full sovereignty, not statehood. It also does not mention what will be the end result of the negotiations. It just says the Palestinian Authority will come, will take responsibility of certain areas, and from that point on, we will be negotiating the final status uh, 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 issues. What were the final status issues that were to be negotiated? Jerusalem, refugees, settlements, security arrangements, borders, relations, and cooperations with other, cooperation with other neighbors and other issues of common interest. These are the final status issue negotiations. The Palestinians and the Israelis only got to discuss that in, you know, uh, quite late in the end of the five years. Th that was supposed to end in 1999. Today we are 2014. So it's way, way overdue the, that, that this negotiation should have ended. And it hasn't. It's not expected to finish. But we are still, until today, we are, we are all working under this framework. We are waiting for these issues to be negotiated. Once these issues are negotiated, supposedly according to the framework, we will get to the final status. Now, we, it doesn't mention a state, by the way. It doesn't say that it is necessarily going to be a state, de independent, or something else. It just says that these are the sub final issue uh, status. All the other agreements were about actually the interim government and the rights and obligations of the interim government and its relationship with the, with the occupying power, with Israel. Now, the refugees were not only mentioned in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, agreement. It was all, they were also mentioned uh, in the Egyptian-Israeli agreement. In the Egyptian-Israeli agreement, it said, uh, said that uh, Egypt and Israel will, will work with each other uh, and with other interested parties to establish agreed <coughs> procedures for a prompt, just, and permanent implementation of the resolution of the refugee problem. What do you feel the text uh, here maybe connotes? What do you feel that implementation of the refugee, uh, of the resolution on the refugee problem? Well, prompt is the biggest joke in this. 
Yes. But what do you feel? What do you feel? What is meant by resolution? The fact that it's called just and permanent makes me feel like it has something. It has to do with returning. Yeah. That's how it. This is the connotation I feel. I feel when I read it, I felt that the word resolution here means the 194 resolution. I think, you know, that calls for the return of the refugees in 1948, which I will mention again later today, and I mentioned late, earlier last week. It's, it's a resolution from the General Assembly that suggests the return of the immediate return of the refugees. Uh, so my feeling is that yeah, the term... It doesn't term say immediate. It says the, at the soonest uh, possible... Practicable date. date. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which is already overdue. I mean, the war ended in 1949, so, you know... It should have been immediate in 49, maybe. Um, and then also, in the Israeli-Jordanian uh, uh, peace agreement, it said that uh, uh, there should be a multilateral forum uh, uh, which will solve the refugee issue in accordance with international law. So this is the text that has come uh, 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 so far. But then, when since the negotiations actually started, Israel expressed, and I'm sure all of you would be or most of you at least will be familiar with the opinion of Israel that this is impossible. The return of the refugees is impossible. That all we can talk about is some types of other solutions, uh, not including the return of the refugees. Uh, so the roadmap and the international community also started to, the international community started to uh, maybe understand and uh, accept the Israeli point of view progressively over time. Not all the international community, maybe the powerful uh, 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 and the mediators, the United States, uh, some <coughs> European uh, uh, countries. And uh, the roadmap, uh, which was basically uh, uh, a mediator uh, uh, um, suggestion, uh, said that an agreed, just, fair, and realistic solution to the refugee issue should be offered. Right? There is the idea that, first, it, was, it has to be agreed. So it means that Israel has to accept whatever solution comes. But then it says also realistic. The terms realistic and agreed a little bit give you the feeling that they make it the idea of return weaker somehow. Uh, but again, it says just. So justice and realistic. I don't know how to deal with the two elements. Justice and realistic are two conflicting issues that always come into our discussions, to be honest with you. What is a just solution? What is a realistic solution? So we actually have two schools. I will talk about them later. There's a school of thought that is realistic, and there's a uh, school of thought that is rights-based approach. I will talk about it in the second presentation more. But I also wanted you to um, maybe to feel also some of the sources of these uh, uh, of these ideas. Um, now, during the negotiations, there were leaks that were uh, uh, published by Al Jazeera and The Guardian. Uh, you will be able to find them. They are available online. Uh, and according to these uh, uh, leaks, at some point in the negotiations, there was some type of an agreement of a symbolic return of 10,000 Palestinian refugees to Israel. So also the, it seems from these leaks that the PLO uh, itself has also agreed to, not to the return, right of return of the millions of Palestinians who were displaced in the 1948 war, but rather uh, a symbolic return of 10,000 Palestinians. Uh, 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 to Israel, and that at some point, apparently, according to the leaks, the negotiators were close to an agreement to this. Uh, that was at the time of Arafat, or uh, no, no, no later, later, later. Oh, like 2008, the leaks were in, in, in maybe nine or ten, and so it was. But at the time of uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen. Um, now, <coughs> this <coughs> proposal was revoked. Sorry. Wasn't there at one point, uh, didn't they talk about 100,000? No? Um, I thought I heard this. This was something that happened actually right after 48. The yeah. wh bef before the ideas of peace happened, uh, you know, of, of peace agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, because the international community really thought that it was totally unjust to displace uh, all this number. Uh, and th there was a point when the Israelis said, well, we might accept to give 100,000 uh, re uh, to return only, and the others would said no, all of them, and eventually they didn't agree, and all of the refugees stayed outside. But this, there was something like that in the early stages after 
that the refugee issue came came out. But now we're talking about 10,000. Uh, but then Sipi Livni said later that the number of refugees that will be allowed to return will be zero. This is an, a statement she made later, that there will be not one returning refugee. And this is the explanation that, uh, 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 that she gives to this uh, uh, opinion. Uh, she says, the basis for the creation of the state of Israel is that it was created for the Jewish people. Your state will be an answer will be the answer to all Palestinians, including refugees. Putting an end to claims means fulfilling national rights for all. So this is this represents now the you know not Sipi Livni only, but generally the opinion of the state of Israel regarding the Palestine refugees of 1948. This is a Jewish state. It is for the Jewish people. If a Palestinian state comes out of the negotiations, this is the homeland of the Palestinian people. You go there, they go there here, and uh, that's a good way to... But it's not realistic because on, on, the, on these two states you have people from here and people from there. So yeah, that's it's true. It's all mixed up. That's true. And you have part of the people uh, in Gaza which is not connected. And it's all a mess. That's true. That's true. It's. Um, it's impossible to create uh, pure ethnic states. No, it's a, it's a, it's a discrimination. It's and not it's a discrimination. A, it's, you know the word in Hebrew, chutzpah. Chutzpah, yes. Fadiha. Fadiha, right, in Arabic? And part of this is Wa'aha. Wa'aha, not fadiha. Wa'aha. How do you say? Wa'aha. 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 <laughs> okay, so all of this discussion was on the 1948 refugees. It's also important now to tell you, uh, and it's always important to remember, that while I tried as much as possible during this course to talk about the refugees issue and the displaced persons and those whose uh, who identity cards were revoked over the time, and those who, uh, whose houses were demolished uh, over, time of, over the conflict, etc. All the different waves of displacement, I talk about them usually trying to combine them under one uh, understanding, one concept, because that's, you know, this is a methodological approach that I, I have been taking. But the peace process does not follow this methodological, methodological approach. It actually treats every group differently. So uh, what applies for the 1948 refugees does not apply for the 1967 uh, displaced persons. First, they were called displaced persons. <coughs> and that's not only an Israeli, Palestinian, Egyptian, Jordanian uh, way of calling it. Uh, this has already started in 1967 because, I think because, when the West Bank was part of, the, of Jordan, somehow it was part of the state of Jordan, uh, Gaza Strip was uh, not part of Egypt, but administrated by Egypt. The Syrian Golan Heights were, was part of, obviously, of Syria. Uh, Sinai was part of Egypt. And when the war happened, people were displaced. It was seen that people were displaced internally. That everybody was, you know, th the West Bankers were displaced to Jordan. That they were displaced persons. It, the term displaced persons is usually it's like uh, internally displaced persons. It's an, uh, some kind of an acronym uh, to the idea of it's internally displaced. Now, this is not true. I mean, this is not totally true. It, it is partially true, yes, there were many persons who were t internally displaced, but there were also persons who, were, uh, uh, who, who, can, who should be called refugees, not only displaced persons. Uh, but this doesn't make a big difference for the current discussion. But anyway, the, the discussion around displaced or refugees, I find it also problematic. Yes. Because either way, they are refugees. Of course. And either they way, by the way, they have the same rights, eventually. Displaced persons, the only difference, the only difference is in the protection. In the? In the protection of, of a person. So if you're a refugee, you left your country, you went to another country, uh, you become part of this uh, concept of uh, refugee and asylum, uh, asylum seeker, and you seek protection from another state, and you seek protection also from UNHCR usually, if you're not Palestinian. If you're Palestinian, displaced in, in the areas where the UNRWA works, you would usually most probably seek uh, uh, the aid from UNRWA if, if you qualify for it. 
Um, so, um, uh, so the idea, the difference is, is, is with who is going to give you the help and the services once you have left your home. But this place is within your country? Then your country should be, uh, should take yeah. care of you. But that's the difference, because of this. Yes. The refugees from another country? In another this country. Place is within your Internally, country. this place is within your country. Exactly. Uh, yeah, but, but, uh, but still, the, the responsibility is still on the same country that made you a refugee. Of course. Of course. It's just about the remedy and about the, uh, the humanitarian help. The humanitarian, the temporary help that you will get as long as you are still displaced, as long as you have not returned to your home, you need some help, you need a status if you're a refugee. If you're a refugee, you crossed borders. <coughs> you don't have a visa to the new country. What are you? You're an asylum seeker. Once you are granted the asylum, you're a refugee, right? <coughs> if you have moved within your own country, you don't need a new status. You're still the same person with the same, you know, you're moving within your country, but you are unable to go back to your home. So you become internally displaced, but you don't need your citizenship allows you, or your status, in that case, not necessarily citizenship, will allow you to move within your country. So for the Palestinians who went to Jordan, maybe, at the 67, they were actually two groups. <coughs> Some of them were from the West Bank. At the time of 1967, they were citizens of Jordan. So they supposedly moved within their own country, because Jordan and well, the West Bank were one country, right? It, it, it changed in 1988, but at that time, this was the situation. But then there were refugees who went from Gaza to Jordan, which is quite surprising. They had to cross Israel to be displaced to Jordan. And um, uh, that's a long way to, 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 to go. But they went to Jordan, and they ended up in Jordan, and they are still in Jordan. But, but they, they don't have cit citizenship. They don't have, until today, they don't have citizenship. They have residency. They are refugees, they don't have a Jordanian citizenship until today. So in Jordan, you will find Palestinians who don't have citizenship. Most Palestinians have a full citizenship, but there are some who don't. Why, why do they because they are from Gaza. They did not have the citizenship before the war. But if they would go to Egypt, it would be okay. No. No, they were also they, because they Egypt never annexed Gaza yeah. Strip. So there are many refugees in Egypt who have a residency status and special permits and special uh, passports that uh, uh, Egypt issues for them and renewable per uh, residency, but not, uh, not, not, they're not citizens. But they're not refugees? No, they are refugees. Ah, they're considered refugees just mm. like the ones that go to Jordan. But there is no UNRWA in, uh, in Egypt. <coughs> the UNRWA only f works uh, in, uh, in, in, in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon, in the West Bank, in Gaza. But those 67 refugees uh, in Jordan from Gaza are also being uh, served by the UNRWA. Yes, the UNRWA in '67 was asked for assistance to to, to extend its mm. assistance to the, to new, and they even built new refugee camps in '67. So the refugee camps that are in Jordan today, especially Jordan, Jordan is the biggest receiver of refugees in in, in the world of Palestinian refugees of this in the world. So many of the, some of the <coughs> camps in Jordan are after 1967, are recent, quite recent. Okay. Not recent, but after 67. <coughs> in last year's Nakba festival, there was a movie yes. about a 67 <coughs> refugee which, uh, who was received by 48 refugees in, uh, in Jordan. It was received by, more, by other refugees. By, by, by the veterans. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Well, then it's not true to say that Jordan was in a different way from other countries uh, uh, for, for the refugees. Sorry? Because it's not true to say that Jordan behaved in a different way, that, he, that Jordan gave uh, citizenship right. to the refugees. Not to all the refugees. They had, they already had the <laughs> Not Jordanian. all of them. Look, the ones who were displaced in 48 did not have. Ah, okay. So let's uh, imagine okay. someone who was uh, uh, displaced from Tel Aviv yeah, yeah, okay. to Jordan. Mm -hmm. So those got the Jordanian... They, uh, all of them, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, and equally also those who went to the West Bank from here, from what became Israel in 67, went to the West Bank, were under the Jordanian sovereignty. Mm -hmm. They all got the citizenship. Mm -hmm. They all got the Jordanian citizenship. But the same didn't happen to those who went to Lebanon or to Syria or to other other parts. Um, 
can I have one question just uh, uh, to go back maybe to the first session that regarding Egypt uh, why why not a lot of Palestinians arrived in 48 to Egypt and met most of them in Gaza and why there wasn't any refugee camps in Egypt that's a good question because mm-hmm. Gaza is full of I don't know the answer actually mm-hmm. and it, it, it is a question I thought about but I never looked for the answer I think it is worth to, to look for it Because it's true, Gaza is really full of refugees. Mm-hmm. It is uh, um, the majority of the population of Gaza is refugee. So why didn't any of them go further? Uh, yeah, th- because there is the a desert further south. I mean, I may have gone to El Arish, but uh, I don't know. If I mean, A, I think it might be the desert. B, I think the Egyptians themselves were forceful, like, don't cross this line. Probably. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe they concentrated them in, in Gaza? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. That's what I would assume. Yeah. Because otherwise that would have been the case. You're talking about 67? No, 48. Okay. 48. <laughs> um. Well, also, if you think they, they, will, they believe they're coming back soon, so Gaza is nearer. Why should they go further? At the beginning, yeah, of course. in 1948, they believed they're soon coming back. Yeah, yeah. Why should they go further? Probably, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but I, I really don't know the actual uh, answer. So, you know, I, I can, yeah, maybe that, maybe this, I don't know. Uh, but, um, so again, now let's get back to the 1967 displaced persons. Uh, so these are a, a group of internally displaced persons and refugees uh, but who eventually ended up being outside the borders of the Israeli controlled territory right of the West Bank and Gaza and Jordan and, and the rest of the world uh, Israel and uh, all the other uh, um, parties to peace agreements uh, had a different uh, uh, approach uh, to this uh, wave of, of or these victims of displacement um, According to the 1978 uh, um, agreement uh, between Egypt and Israel, uh, the suggested solution was during the transitional period, transitional period after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, um, representatives of Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and the self-governing authority will cons- uh, constitute a, a continuing committee, right? Continuing committee, that's the name of the committee. to decide by agreement on the modalities of admission of persons displaced from the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, together with necessary measures to prevent disruption, etc. So the idea was to discuss that there will be negotiations during the transitional period. So it's not that this issue will be decided before the transitional period starts. The transitional period and the self-governing authority will come, will be installed first, and then There will be a, a continuing committee which is formed by Egyptian, Jordanian, Israeli uh, representatives who will be discussing what the modalities of admission. What do you understand from modalities of admission? Mm-hmm. As opposed to what, you know, what, what will, uh, as, as opposed to if you compare them with the refugees. It doesn't say admission to where? To the West Bank and Gaza. <coughs> But what do you understand from the terms modalities of admission? That what, you, what one would understand, I believe, is that uh, we're just discussing how to get them, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Not whether to, to allow them yeah. to return. How to allow, m- modalities of admission. So now first, I also noticed that there is the term return was never mentioned, which is very important in the Palest- Palestinian psyche. Return, right of return, we want to return, Audi, was never, mentioned in any agreement. You will see also in the other, in the Palestinian agreement that the word return. Here it says the modalities of admission. Admission as in allowing them to enter. Right, to enter. Uh, 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 um, the same type of text also was in the Declaration of Principles in the Oslo uh, Peace Agreement. The two parties will invite, uh, 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 and it was uh, put under this title of How do, keep, uh, how do you read the first word? Liaison? Liaison. Liaison? Liaison. 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 Okay. okay, because it feels too French for me to say in English. Liaison. <laughs> it is? Okay. And cooperation with Jordan and Egypt. So it was more about the cooperation and 
But then it goes to that there will be a continuing committee, and the continuing committee will decide by agreement the modalities of admission, the same text, mm -hmm. the exact same text from 1978, uh, 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 that we will discuss the modalities of admission of displaced persons uh, who were displaced from the West Bank and Gaza Strip in 1967. Again, modalities of admission. And then in the Declaration of Principles, and this was something actually negotiated by the Palestinian negotiators, Apparently, the Palestinians were afraid because there was elections. The Palestinian self-government was go supposed to be elected, not just appointed. Uh, so uh, initially, the Palestinian negotiators asked that uh, the Palestinians who were displaced from the West Bank and Gaza Strip, whether by during the war or by revo re revocation of residency over the years, should be allowed to participate in the elections even when they are still abroad mm. right mm. israel refused but as a as a middle ground they agreed the <coughs> next line in the uh, in the agreement that the future status of the displaced palestinians who were uh, registered on da 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 uh, will not be prejudiced because they are unable to participate in the election process due to practical reasons Mm -hmm. So the Palestinians, the negotiators felt that they were protecting somehow the right of return which was supposedly recognized by the article that says modalities of admission as opposed to let's discuss the whole issue in the final status negotiations, right? Uh, it felt that it was uh, protecting this uh, population <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, working on guaranteeing, not prejudicing their right to return by their inability to participate in the elections. Now, what ha actually happened? This was all in text, but what actually hap happened? There was no agreement. The continuing committee met several times. There were two points of view, Palestinian and Israeli. They ag disagreed about who is a displaced person who should be allowed to be readmitted to the West Bank and Gaza. Obviously, this was supposed to happen immediately. We had only five years of transitional period uh, during which these people should have returned before discussing the permanent status issues. But the parties did not agree. The Palestinians thought that there are one million displaced persons. Uh, these are the Palestinians who, are living out who were living outside the occupied territory at the time of the war. Palestinians who left the occupied territory during or immediately uh, after the war, uh, Palestinians whose residency was revoked, and Palestinians whom Israel deported. So they had, they had in mind, the Palestinians were imagining that we are talking about the return of one million people to the West Bank and Gaza, or allowing the return of one million people to the West Bank. The Israeli position was that it was only the displaced persons who were displaced by the war and their number was only 200,000 people. The years passed, uh, Palestinians and Israelis negotiated, the continuing committee continued to negotiate over the years. Um, there was no agreement. What happened in 2000? The second intifada started. The peace process was frozen. Uh, the Palestinian population registry was frozen. You remember our discussion about the population registry? It was frozen. No new people could be added to the registry except with very limited uh, uh, conditions. So all of the displaced persons who supposedly uh, were granted the right of return even within the peace process <coughs> also were the had the same fate of the refugees who were displaced in 48. They, none of them has returned because the five years went on with no agreement. Uh, and, uh, and meanwhile, I, I, I always wonder, wh well, you had at least agreement on 200,000 people. Why don't you let them in first and then negotiate the rest? But this never happened. I, I don't understand. What are you talking about? Return to where? To the occupied territories? West Bank and Gaza. And East Jerusalem, obviously, as well. Now, this is a... Yes. So this is what I'm saying. There were 
the, the, the different waves of displacement were divided into different elements in the peace agreement. The refugees of 1948, these are called refugees. The people who were displaced in 48 are called refugees. The refugees uh, were uh, postponed to the final status negotiation. Yeah, but you said. Right? No, these are the refugees. Now there is the second wave, which is in the 1967 revocation. <coughs> and according to, the, to, the, to this group, uh, they were supposed to be admitted according to the text. So they were allowed to return according to the text. But their, the modalities of their return, how they are going to return, the practicality of the return was given to the organization of or to the agreement of a, a subcommittee called the Continuing Committee. But the Continuing Committee never reached an agreement. It's still continuing. It's still continuing, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly, but this is the fate of many issues in the negotiation, in the Palestinian Israeli <coughs> process. Mm. Well, yeah, there is a question here which uh, I think from the Israeli point of view it doesn't make much difference because we don't want any refugees anyway. But uh, some of those displaced in 67 were 48 refugees, actually. Of course. Mm -hmm. So, of course. So, are they? For, I mean, if they come under the status of 67, yes. that is, we shall negotiate their, uh, the, the modalities of their return to the, to the West Bank or Gaza, then do they forfeit their right uh, of return to... Uh, yeah. My argument is no. Uh, my opinion mm -hmm. is no. I know that this is not... Uh, uh, this question was asked to me once when I wrote a, a paper one time when I asked for uh, the, the immediate return of everybody who was displaced from Gaza Strip to Gaza Strip, including the refugees who had been already displaced from Israel to Gaza and then from Gaza elsewhere. So in my opinion, uh, the return will be, there is your right to return to Gaza because you were displaced from Gaza, but then you have another right of return, which is to your original homeland, which is Israel. Uh, I don't feel that I, I don't see a reason in international law, and that's the source mm -hmm. of 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 of, uh, of of our knowledge basically on these issues. Uh, there is no reason to forfeit your right of return to Israel if you return to you to another place that you were displaced mm -hmm. from. These are two different rights, um, and I think it's important to start implementing whatever is possible in terms of right of return. Um, now, residency revocations. That was the other issue. Remember we discussed the issue of residency revocations? Mm -hmm. we, we said uh, that was not the last one, but two, two weeks ago, uh, that uh, <coughs> there were some 250, almost quarter million Palestinians who acquired, who stayed in the West Bank and Gaza after the war, they were granted the blue, green, uh, blue and orange and red ID cards that Israel uh, started designed after the war. They kept them, but then they traveled and they lost, they, their residences were revoked. Now, how do we call uh, the residency revocation in our local uh, Palestinian daily language. We call it Sahb al which means uh, uh, ID card uh, revocation, or re re yeah, ID card revocation. Because the symbolic act that Israel did, as I told you, remember that if you traveled abroad, you would keep your ID card at the border crossing, whether it's the Alembi Bridge or uh, at, at times also at Rafah crossing. Uh, people used to leave the ID card there, physically leave it. And if they don't come back at the time of the permit that al that the permit allows, they were not given back the ID cards. So <coughs> the policy is called Sahb al Hawiyat from a yani, from Palestinian uh, perspective. Um, and it's the same in Jerusalem today. When a Palestinian loses his residency status, this this, this document, the, the ID card, also gets revoked. So we also call it today Sahb al Hawiyat, the revocation of ID cards. But so it actually means the revocation of the residency status. It's mm -hmm. a much bigger than that. The uh, revocation of the ID card is a symbolic, uh, not it's, it's a, uh, let's say it's a bureaucratic 
uh, element in this uh, bigger uh, uh, revocation of residence? They would be no, so so they would be considered what they would be considered uh, displaced in this case. Of course, of not, course, not not uh, refugees. Well, if they end up if outside they go to another country, they would if be they go to another country, they are refugees. And yes, they are refugees. Obviously, yes, not internally displaced. Um, now, the issue of those who <coughs> whose residences were revoked also came in the. It didn't come up in the uh, Egyptian. Israeli uh, agreement, but it came up in the Declaration of Principles. Um, the text said, a joint committee will be established to solve, uh, to solve the reissuance of identity cards to those residents who have lost their ID cards. What do you feel about this text? How does it feel? To you? If you can read it, it's on the right, left, in the on the left. A joint committee will be. What do you feel that uh, what was given here? Promise to reissue the, uh, the ID card. Yes. Yeah, it will happen. It's a bit ironic, you know. What do you mean, lost? Uh, it lost, uh, lost their card. Yes. It's like <laughs> I took it out of my pocket and it, it dropped, dropped it to the street. Yeah. This is exactly what the Israeli negotiator in this committee said. Yeah. They said, well, we, you know, it says lost their ID cards. So somebody loses his ID card, we'll give him back another ID card. That's the whole point. This is what the, this is actually what happened during the negotiating of the joint committee. While obviously in the initial negotiations, the idea was that we're talking about residency revocations and granting back a residency status to, to somebody who was revoked. But the text here, which is very ironic, says a joint committee will be established to solve to solve the, resi the reissuance of re identity cards to those residents who have lost their identity cards. Uh, uh, this text obviously came into negotiations later. What did we mean when we actually said this? The Israelis said, well, somebody lost their ID cards. Uh, the idea is to give them back. The Palestinians, what did they say? Well, no, we're talking about 200 quarter a million persons who already went through your system and took your ID card and then you revoked that ID card because you revoked the whole residency so you need to you need to give back residence. This negotiation continued for years until um, the year 2000 came. Uh, Israelis had already recognized eventually by the end of that that it's true the issue is reissuance of a whole residency status to give them back the residency but then the issue was okay do we give it to them or do we give it to them and their children and their families and the uh, co negotiation <coughs> continues five years is not enough to negotiate with Israel obviously on these issues and the issue was also nobody got according to this article no, nobody got a residency back basically. so it had the same fate of the refugees of 1948 and of the displaced persons of 1967, they all had the same fate of no return. They were on negotiating tables. What did they talk about all the time? <laughs> they waste time. No, I mean all these. What is there to say? Who? The people in this in these committees all the time. What do they talk about? Right. Should I can make a belief. <laughs> no, but what do you really say? How how much can you say nothing? Uh, talk, talk you can waste as much time as you want in a meeting. Well, I probably drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Takes two to tango. You can sp you can really waste a lot of time in if if you don't want to um, to reach an agreement, it's easy to um, uh, to do that. Actually. How much can you talk about nothing? <laughs> it seems for a long, long, long time. How long has the negotiations? We are today in two thousand and fourteen, almost fifteen. <coughs> The peace process started in, in uh, 1993. So already we are approaching 21 years, or we have 21 years of, of, of the peace process. And we've been discussing, negotiating, almost consistently since then, with some breaks, when people said, we don't want to negotiate anymore, this is not helping. But we have been really negotiating since then. And it hasn't really helped. But I think there is lack of intention in uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to reach an agreement. And this is the next slide, actually. 
Yossi Sarid, and I'm going to start with the right before the left. I'll do it the Arabic way and the Hebrew way, for that matter. Um, Yossi Sarid, uh, who was uh, a minister and uh, a politician, what, what happened? Can you please go back? Okay. Thank you. Okay, he said, each one who uh, loves to take but hates to give becomes addicted to talks on condition that there won't be any results. There won't be any? Results. Plants the trees of life, let yet loathes the fruit of knowledge. This is how it goes. When we set a table with the Palestinian side, Palestine first, because the Palestinian problem is the heart of the conflict, as we all know, on the path to an agreement, we turn, ev we turn over every stone. This is, uh, this too is common knowledge. So what Yusuf Sarid is saying, yes, we do sit on negotiating table, but when we s after we sit on the negotiating table, we don't re we don't reach an agreement. It became known uh, now over time that there is no will to reach an agreement. The will is to actually negotiate and to spend time in negotiating and to spend time in negotiating while doing building settlements, building colonies, displacing more persons. Uh, so in reality, actually, there were more displacements, for example, in Jerusalem after the peace process. You remember the resi residency revocation issue in Jerusalem? Uh, with a different, a simple math uh, thing that I did from uh, Beit Salem's website, which uh, documents uh, the, govern the numbers that the Israeli govern government gives on residences revoked. Um, in 19 2011, there had been 13,000 uh, Palestinians from Jerusalem whose residences were revoked. Among these 13,000 people, 11,000 were after the peace process started. The overwhelming majority of the people who were displaced by residency revocation were after the peace process started. And if you also remember, lots of m new discriminatory policies also were introduced after the peace process. All the uh, limits on, uh, on, uh, on family unification uh, and everything, lots of things actually were, became worse after the peace process. And Nobody, no victim gained any uh, remedies also after uh, 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 the peace uh, process. <coughs> now, in addition to this, these were the displaced persons, whether internally displaced or refugees, but these are all victims of displacement that were actually mentioned in the peace process framework, which includes Camp David, Oslo, Palestinian Jordanian Israeli agreement. More than other than these groups, 1948 refugees, 1967 displaced persons, those who lost their ID cards. Other than these groups, uh, there was no other group of victims that was mentioned or negotiated. Well, I don't, I can't say what was negotiated. I wasn't present, but I would doubt that many groups were even negotiated. There was no mention of, uh, for example, unrecognized villages in the Naqab Desert, Negev. It's from an Israeli point of view, a pure Israeli math issue that nobody should interfere with. There was no uh, um, discussion about internally displaced even in the West Bank. It wasn't an issue in the negotiations. There was nothing about home demolitions, which rose dramatically also. After, uh, after, after the peace process started. So the peace process not only failed to, to tackle the issues that it actually tackled, or to, to solve the problems that it actually tackled, it also failed to tackle many issues that it should have uh, dealt with. It should have, ha it should have uh, introduced new principles of equality, of uh, reparations to the victims, of uh, new policies, 
but the peace process failed to do all of that. And uh, now it's the time to, uh, with, with the mm. first song actually, because today I, I have two songs for you. Uh, the first one is uh, this one, uh, it's by uh, a rap group uh, that is based in, uh, uh, it's from a lid uh, called Dam. And it's a song called uh, Who is a Terrorist? Mean Erhabi. Um, and I, I, am, uh, I am just playing this song for uh, maybe most importantly this line, where they say, I am not, aga I'm not against peace. Peace is against me. So I really find it uh, quite uh, expressive of the way Palestinians think. Because usually now, the word peace became somehow, despite the, the beauty of the word peace and how the word peace is, <coughs> is uh, um, uh, it's one of the names of God, As-Salam. As-Salam, you know, God has 99 words, 99 names in, in Islamic uh, uh, culture. One of them is As-Salam, the peace. Uh, it's uh, when we greet people, we say Assalamu Alaikum. So the word peace supposedly, in, from a cultural point of view, original cultural point of view, is certainly uh, an important, respectful term. But because of the peace process, now if you tell someone, do you want peace? Like, what peace? <laughs> people get angry by the term peace now. Uh, but that's not because people hate peace, it's because people feel that peace hates them. Peace is against them. Uh, so I'm going to play uh, the, the song for you. Um, although I'm sorry the sound will not be that good because uh, I did not manage, to, we didn't manage to, to make... Uh, 50 years of assault on Palestinian rights. I, I chose this track because it has translation. The Iraqi people are the most terrorized on earth and have been for so many years. Practically every Palestinian lives in constant harassment, threat of violence, humiliation, and that way for a long, long time. Oh, man, man. Oh, 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 man. O
So that was uh, the song that I wanted to share with you more. Uh, the Sad and Band is from Lee? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mean, that wasn't listening? Of course it was. I'm sure it is. Yeah. What? What did you say? He's asking Shin Bet wasn't listening. I said, I'm mm -hmm. sure it is listening. <laughs> to the song? Yes. No? I don't know what Shin Bet's schedule yeah. is usually, but uh, <laughs> I would assume that they know about them, no? Mm -hmm. Of course. So what? They will arrest them for singing? Well, they haven't, to the rest of my yeah, knowledge, they so they sing without a problem. But, um, but this is, yeah, this is one of the songs. And um, obviously the video probably was not uh, designed by them, I'm sure, because even the translation on their website, there is another official translation, but I wanted to play the music and the translation at the same time, so I chose, this is the only one where I saw that it, they go together. What's the word terrorist? Happy? Yeah. Happy. Irhabi? Irhabi, yes. Irhabi is terrorism and Irhabi is terrorism. <coughs> um, so yes, I, uh, I, you know, I wanted to end uh, uh, with this to, again, just to stress, uh, I, I don't know if you read uh, more of the lyrics other than I'm not against peace, peace is against me. There was reference to displacement, reference to killing, reference to home demolitions, all of these issues. Uh, so when you feel that despite the fact that to the rest of the world, the re uh, from the outside, well, there's a peace process going on. People are negotiating. But when you look uh, deeply and you dig inside, you discover that the peace process is not actually solving issues. It's actually uh, either postponing issues or uh, uh, you know, uh, resulting in more, in more problems. Well, it's just a guide for, for letting Israel have its way. <laughs> Continuing yes, it is. <coughs> it is a tool of uh, of wasting time, I guess. It's a good tool. Yeah, of course. <coughs> so what? Uh, what? What is? What do you think? What? What do you feel? Tell me. Today is more time when I would like to also hear from you. There will be another presentation later, but this one is for now. I yes. My lawyer says that a good agreement is an agreement where both sides feel unhappy about it. Meaning everybody had to give up something they care for. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the idea of uh, certain coming together. Yeah. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> who, feels, who feels, what do you feel about the peace process generally? For this issue, for other issues, what? Wait, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, sorry, I thought you did. What I uh, fail to, or at least I, I want to hear your side of things. Why? Um, why is it not beneficial for the Palestinians to agree on the bare minimum? As you said, well, we're now 100,000 people. Why not agree for the, about that? And then at least let those few come in. And then uh, have another disagreement or another settlement of, uh, of uh, negotiations. Wh wh why not pass it out? It seems I like think it has happened. I feel that this, what you're saying, has actually happened. It's already happening. Uh, the way I would, from a human rights point of view, and I belong to a specific school, I'm not a negotiator, I'm not a politician. Uh, I don't even think that I can be one. Um, so from my human rights background and school's point of view, all of the issues should have equal uh, importance, all the victims should be should have uh, remedies. All the victims should be served as soon as possible. But the negotiators and the politicians are more realistic, obviously, uh, and more political. And they have done what you said. Originally, the Palestinians thought, we want all of Palestine, right? with all of the refugees and all of the displaced persons and all the rights to be that you know to all of these rights should be on the same day immediately tomorrow i want to uh, to see everything liberated 
now I'm talking is it Palestinian, pure Palestinian point of view. Is this how the PLO actually worked? Of course not. It actually, from what you see from the agreement itself and the texts that we displayed earlier, uh, you will see that uh, the refugees of 1948 were treated in one way, 67 in another way, another displaced persons in a third way, other people were not even mentioned. So the PLO is quite realistic, mm. uh, quite realistic, quite political. But did it help? This is the question. I don't feel it has helped. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it has? No, obviously not. No. Yeah, well, yeah, but there is one small thing that happened after Oslo, mm -hmm. as far as I know, which was a certain uh, <coughs> possibility of a reunification of uh, families. families. And that this is the window that Israel always kept in some way or another, even since 67 in order to add people to the Palestinian population mm -hmm. registry, they were always added through this window, family unification. Mm -hmm. Nobody came back as a returnee, mm -hmm. returning to his homeland. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, this is for me, from my human rights, again, b background and uh, this type of school, I also find the text problematic. When you say readmission or admission, admission to the territory, or when you use a term like reissuance of ID cards that were lost. This is text of denial. Um, you need to say it as it is. Somebody who was displaced, the person is returning. Right of return. As it, w <coughs> as it was mentioned in other, you know, in Bosnia or in other places in the world. Um, so I don't understand why, um, uh, why even such text would be uh, accepted. If I was negotiated, I, uh, negotiating with this background, I think I would say, no, I would like a different text to be used. Not admission. I wouldn't accept the term admission as, as a term. I wouldn't accept the issuance of ID cards that were lost. What lost? You thought of it was funny. The term lost ID cards and re No, if you think of them sitting for so many hours, days, months, years, already their minds are, they don't, <laughs> you can tell anything to them and they will say, okay, they're, they're so tired, they're so worn yeah, out. Yeah, and eventually they end up agreeing to, mutual, to mutually acceptable text uh, in order to further, further in the future reach, get the parties to agree to mutually accepted modalities of admission, right? Which never happened. Because tell me, what did Israel lose for <coughs> Palestinians not returning? <coughs> Since then, I mean, what did you lose? Lost. What did lost. Lost. No. They said no. there, there is no partner, so there is no. no. Yeah, no. but is, it, is there any urgency? Exactly, they lost peace. Oh. But for from the Israeli point of view, there is no urgency in return. The Israeli uh, 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 point of view has been always that they don't want to see people return, like not even to Gaza Strip, not even to Gaza Strip, which Israel doesn't want anymore. Uh, they don't allow the return. They haven't allowed. And to be honest with you, I even, I, I mentioned that to you in the car the other day. I wrote a paper uh, a while ago, which I presented last year in, in, in the Zofrot conference as well. I've presented two things. Um, in which I argued that since Israel today does not control the border between Gaza and Egypt, that the Palestinians and the Egyptians should immediately start allowing the return of refugees and displaced persons who were displaced from Gaza Strip through the Egyptian-Palestinian border, even if Israel doesn't accept it. I wrote this last, you know, year and a half ago or something. Wait, to Gaza? To Gaza. No, those who were displaced from Gaza should be allowed to return to Gaza yeah. immediately. Yeah. Obviously, this hasn't happened, Yani. That's on the condition that Egypt uh, opens the whole crossing for, for, First you need co for, for goods and everything else. You need the cooperation of Egypt. Yeah. You need uh, 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 Palestinian will to do that. And you need Palestinian will also to, um, to do something that has not been agreed by Israel and accepted by Israel. Yeah. The most important problem that was raised after this was published by the critiques of the article itself, which I also am aware of, I, you know, I was aware of before I wrote that article. It's a policy brief, it's not an article actually. 
was that okay maybe <coughs> if people can physically return to Gaza that's one thing but the fact that they can get ID cards and passports which are issued according to an Israeli system right which you know the, the according to the peace process it's an Israeli Palestinian system that has that only works with an agreement with an Israeli agreement that can only happen with an Israeli acceptance and therefore there can be no passports and no ID cards so they can maybe physically return but after their return they cannot actually keep any real rights uh, so that's uh, that's another problem obviously in my opinion you know they should return anyway but there is a um, obvious objection to this it's it's problematic. No. You need to organize. You need to organize no, no, the status. No, something uh, completely different. You, you are perfectly right about the status and everything else. But Gaza is on the brink of a uh, humanitarian That's collapse. True. As anyway. well, anyway, this was <coughs> raised too. This issue was raised too. Okay. That Gaza is already is, uh, is 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 has too many people and too little water and too little resources. Mm. But do you know that Gaza received refugees? who had been displaced to Syria and who suffered the civil war in Syria and they looked for a place to go. Where did they go? Many of them went to Gaza. What? Yes. Yeah. It became By a place of refuge. By yes. Because uh, in Syria it became terrible after the war. Yeah. The civil war really... I talked about it last, last yeah. week. Mm -hmm. uh, there was hunger, uh, starvation in some places almost. So some, some Palestinians went, took refuge to Gaza after uh, got into the war yes but uh, maybe who knows what's better I don't know um, but I would I would I would say we need to be proactive I mean we need to be proactive about this and start allowing any possible return and the only border that is not totally controlled by Israel now is the Egypt uh, Gaza border um, but obviously also Israel has uh, also strong positions about that border and it doesn't uh, it was very critical of Egypt every time anything happened around the border and now we have uh, the new government that uh, will uh, use uh, the Israeli policies again probably yes yeah I was gonna ask about that what the role in these I guess international actors in kind of speaking for the Palestinians or making decisions that aren't it's not really in their jurisdiction, I guess. So in Egypt and Jordan, I guess would be the principal ones. Um, yeah. And I guess also the the implications of these agreements. So Israel's always saying, uh, oh, they have to accept these prior agreements based on like the international, international agreements, but that's kind of a double standard since they don't respect the other agreements that have been made. Yeah. I mean, with the issue of representation, this was always a problem for Palestinians. Um, when Israel was established, uh, this really destroyed, or not destroyed, it really harmed the Palestinian identity, in a way, or the Palestinian unity, as, as, or uh, Palestinians being one unit. Uh, the Nakba not only displaced 80% of the Palestinians who were in, 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 in what became Israel, but it also harmed the, the political uh, representation and everything. Obviously, we also d discussed earlier that there was something called the All Palestine Government, which supposedly claimed representing the Palestinians. But at the same time, there were other people representing the Palestinians. Jordan was in the West Bank, claiming sovereignty over the West Bank. So it was representing part of the Palestinians. Egypt, which was actually controlling the All Palestine Government, was anyway also representing the Palestinians. And then Abdel Nasser came and he was uh, an important big pan-Arab leader and uh, very significant, very powerful. He had some say, uh, some representation. The <coughs> uh, <coughs> had different types of representation. <coughs> then you got the PLO, which fought for a while to become considered, which they always like keep saying, uh, the sole representative of the Palestinian people the only representative of the Palestinian people. And the, 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 you don't hear that a lot because uh, you would hear it more in Arabic uh, media because for them, this is very important. Who is representing the Palestinians? Actually, in the first time when the Palestinians negotiated, they went under the Jordanian part, uh, group, 
under the Jordanian Waft, Waft, Kif, Waft, uh, Waft delegation. Delegation. Yeah. delegation. Under the Jordanian delegation. Until they became their own delegation in negotiation. That was in Madrid? Madrid, yes. Actually, the only reason there really is. Because Israel had not recognized the PLO yet. Right. But the only reason, uh, my point of view is that the only reason there is peace with Egypt and Jordan is because they relinquished their authority to negotiate for the Palestinians, thereby just dropping the ball and saying, okay, we can talk about other stuff, and whatever happens with the Palestinians, you have to talk to them. Yeah. That's, I think that's the only reason we actually have. Yeah, it was always an issue. It was always also a Palestinian issue. You will feel, you will always hear from Palestinian patriotic uh, thinkers that uh, we need to represent ourselves. We don't want the Arab League to represent us. We don't want anybody else to represent us. We need to be self-representing. And these people will be happy that we have a PLO that will represent us. But then the PLO has represented us, but it didn't really bring fruit so far. So. Uh, the representation of Palestinians has been a problem, but now it is clear that it's the PLO that represents the Palestinians, generally. Well, now and you have uh, Gaza and, and Hamas, which are separated yeah. from the uh, West Bank leadership. Yes. It's now split. Not anymore, supposedly. Well, it's y yes and no, that's true. It was split for a while. It's not split now? No. Now there is one government. Now there is one government, but uh, it's a bit. Uh, I don't understand it to be honest. Now <coughs> I seriously don't understand now what's happening. I mean, I don't know really what. Uh, it's a hoax. Sorry. It's a hoax. Yeah, I, I really look. I know that there is an agreement of uh, reconciliation, mm -hmm. and I know that there is one government now that supposedly works in both mm -hmm. sides of the, uh, of the in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, but I don't understand how much this authority, this government, has authority over things in Gaza, especially the security sector. Even things in Qatar, with, uh, Marshall and whatever. No, that's different. That's not an authority. That's more of political, I think. I mean, Qatar is, I mean, Mashal is a political... No, ma w what's his uh, uh, position in, in the government? Nothing. Nothing, exactly. But you asked the, the, the Gaza <coughs> people, Nobody has a position in the government. I mean, Ismail Haniyeh has no position. He has. Abu Mazen has no position. No, no I mean, Ismail Haniyeh was prime minister. Until he was, but uh, this unity government is supposed to be a technocrat government. Supposedly, yes. So Ismail Haniyeh is not in the government now. Sure. And Abu Mazen is not in the government. No, Abu Mazen is the president. He's the president, okay, but. So Rami Hamdallah is the prime minister now. Yes. There is something about all this information that it is extremely, extremely difficult to bring across to, I think, uh, many Israeli, many Israelis in general, in particular many Israeli Jews. There is something about what we would call the bureaucracy of evil that is a very elusive, very complicated. Mm. Very, it needs this uh, in, in, in order to understand it. And I, and I keep thinking that there were so many. Uh, you asked before, um, if the co there was a question here about, you know, they sit and talk and talk and talk. And I think about uh, the fact that did Palestinians really, really believe that one committee after another committee after this, uh, you know, one thing after another, to this whole. Um, uh, Process. You know, it's kind of a make-believe a make -believe kind of thing that, you know, I mean, was it something that people really believed, really believed in it? Really? I mean, it, it seems like there's a, like, a, I don't know how to explain it, like uh, there are two you know, languages, two realities, two, uh, I mean, it seems so obvious that all these committees and all the and everything that is going on is in really in order for the occupation to continue in a, in a you know to gain time and time and time and time and time until it will be irreversible. 
And and I ask myself, uh, when you talk about all this all this bureaucracy, all, did Palestinians really believe all these years that that there was no master pl plan behind it? A master plan in It is a master plan indeed. Yeah. And did this was something <coughs> that it's a master plan since nineteen at least seventy eight that we had to adhere to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> no, I I'm s I uh, no, but I'm, it's not even a question, it's like a comment, but I no. but I'm asking myself really Did we believe it? What? Did we believe it? Yeah. I think I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we believed it. I think that in the early times, early, you know, nineteen ninety three, ninety four, I think people were optimistic. People were celebrating in the streets. Yeah. Also in Israel. Yes. Mm -hmm. People were optimistic, they were celebrating, they were happy, they were like, Okay, this is over, uh, a Palestinian state will come. It felt like that was in good faith. It, it looked like <coughs> that. Uh, it looked. It's, 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 it, it, people felt so. People were hopeful. People cannot lose hope. So people were hopeful and they thought. Now, I don't know about the PLO. I feel that also the politicians from their part might have also been optimistic. <coughs> <coughs> Maybe, um, you know, the Israelis are tired. We are tired. We all want to finish. Uh, the Intifada has... Uh, some effect uh, to, to pressure for a peace uh, agreement. Uh, what does Israel want? You know, analysts would think, what does Israel want? It actually wants to have a Jewish state in. Uh, so if we accept, if we accept the idea of a state only in 67 territory, if we accept to take only 22 percent of Palestine and leave them the 78 percent of Palestine, this should be okay. This has been the case and. We have we know many Palestinians who advocated for the Palestinians. Look, you have to accept uh, what you said earlier. You have to act. You have to be realistic. Accept uh, the minimum. You have accept. You have to accept less. Mm. And uh, uh, um, until you reach a win-win solution, we had people going to different parts of the world. Uh, like uh, um, we still have until today grassroots people going for different types of uh, uh, peace uh, uh, activities um, becoming also optimistic about that people meeting together feeling that we can be uh, we can be equal we can be we are the same we are all people uh, but what does eventually brings ba us back to this is that the fact that this is stuck this is not working first from a theoretical... It's meant to be stuck, I think. In many yes. ways, it's meant First, to from be stuck. a theoretical point of view, even with the text, in the best situation, it's terrible. If it is implemented, I am not comfortable with it. And I'm not saying here as Munir, I'm saying more trying to, to be representative of a human rights point of view, if I am allowed to do that. Uh, not comfortable with it. But at the same time, even if we accept that text that this is excellent and we should implement it, it has not been implemented. And has been designed to be stuck for who knows how long. Um, and uh, and we know that this is going to continue to be like that. So this peace process, and that's why I usually like to put it between the quotation marks, is uh, is not successful. Actually, it was <coughs> the uh, I, I was puzzled as uh, Michal is about. Uh, I mean, I met many Palestinians who were very optimistic yeah. immediately after also. And uh, many Israelis, as you said. Uh, there is at least one very famous Palestinian who wrote several days after Oslo that it's a catastrophe. Yeah. That was Edward Said. Edward Said. Nobody would listen to him. <coughs> and there were a few Israelis, I think, on the, what's called the radical left, who understood very soon that this is a sham. In fact, there was one uh, Kobe Neal, who is uh, mm -hmm. a satirical uh, journalist, uh, wrote very soon after that that Shimon Peres should have gotten a Nobel Prize for peace process, not for peace. <laughs> 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 yeah, the thing is, the funny thing is that yeah. why would the Palestinian negotiator accept to get into uh, the weak position of a self-government under is very strong occupation regime to put themselves under this regime and negotiate from this position. 
I don't understand why. I don't understand that. Obviously, I understand the rationale of the Israelis why they would want what that. Choice yeah. did, what choice would they have? <coughs> to negotiate everything not before. Nego- no, no. Before starting, it said not to accept a self government in the first place. Negotiate, finish negotiations, and then phases for phase the implementation if you want. You can phase implementation, but not phase the negotiation uh, uh, altogether. Why do you get yourself under a powerful government? You put yourself under a shoe and then start negotiating. This doesn't make sense from a... Po- yes? Now, this is where the political has to come in. I mean, there are several factors that involved. I mean, in 87, you had the Intifada. And the PLO were basically all these people in exile. They were not involved in the Intifada. So for the PLO, they start to have to... They need to come back into West Bank Gaza in order to kind of capitalize on the Intifada. At the same time, you also have to think about cold, uh, like the Cold War politics. The USA was making a big push, and the PLO was realizing, okay, we're no longer going to have support of the old countries. We need to kind of cater to uh, the, the U.S. Yeah, I mean, so this is why when they end up getting the negotiation sort of uh, framework, they're like, uh, yeah, Arafat was like, no, we need to do this. There was a, there was a strategic thinking in the way, but it was with, it was with various kinds of uh, conditions that, okay, we're willing to do this. Because the PLO was losing a lot of things. It, again, a lot of the action was action was happening uh, inside the 67 borders. The PLO would do anything in order to come in, come in on that. Uh, and so, yeah, the, 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 again, uh, many different factors, but these are among some of the influences which would lead the PLO, I think, to just be like, uh, you know, it's better than us being outside. Let's get, let's at least get inside and take whatever from there. Which I think is why they're willing to accept that mm-hmm. lower position again for the, the you know local Palestinian issues, the Israeli circumstances, and the American policy. Yeah. To be honest with you, I actually heard this argument from uh, from someone before, someone who is also affiliated maybe with the PLO. And the, uh, the always the first idea that comes to my mind after hearing that is, who works for whom? Does the PLO work for us, or do we work for the PLO? Mm-hmm. The, this rationale is that, well, the PLO felt it was away, it was losing, it was in Tunis, yeah. uh, <laughs> the world is going on, so it needed to do something to get power, and then what is better than come back to Palestine and start, even if they were not optimistic mm-hmm. enough that this will necessarily work, but at least start this. Thing. But is this why we fought? Do we fight for the PLO? Do we want to, you know, who's who's there to serve whom? So this is this is also a problem. Did you want to say something? No. We should take a break. Yes, uh, we are more than an hour and a half right now. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, coming back again. Not such a break, not escaping. Uh, and uh, this would be the, our, our last part of, uh, of this course. Um, and it's basically about the remedies. What should we be discussing? What should be on the table? We, knew, we know what violations we're talking about. Um, we know also how the peace process is tackling the issue so far. And we're going to discuss now the remedies from both an international law point of view and a transitional justice point of view. My argument usually would be that the transitional justice point of view is not that different from international law point of view. Um, In fact, this and most maybe of what I have been uh, discussing with you uh, has been part of, uh, of, of the thesis that I wrote for my PhD, actually, which is also available online, and you can all read it and use its references and everything. Um, and um, the main argument here is, as, as I mentioned earlier, we discussed now the peace process and how the peace process worked uh, and took the issue. But now let's go around the peace process and uh, discuss the schools of thought that have developed um, around this peace process. At least from uh, the Palestinian point of view, we have had uh, two major schools of thought. Um, One was called, one is known, it defines itself, it calls itself the rights-based approach. The rights-based approach is more of the human rights group. 
it says usually we want all the rights that are stipulated in international law. It usually <coughs> refers to two rights, right of return of refugees and right to compensation, uh, repatriation, uh, restitution of property. These are the main things that the rights-based approach usually uh, uh, advocates, usually refers to. And the discussion is mainly about the Palestinian refugees of 1948, also from a Palestinian point of view. Why? Probably because people are not so worried about the <coughs> because uh, from the text of the peace agreements, it's just a readmission that we are talking about, not even return. Return is recognized implicitly by Israel through the text of its agreement. Um, but I believe the discussion should become bigger and include everything because nobody is really returning anywhere, right? Now, the other school um, um, has no name, um, but um, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't call itself a name, I mean. It doesn't use itself. A, but I, would, I called it the realistic uh, group. And this is uh, maybe the one that you would be referring to, you were referring to earlier, maybe in one of your comments or questions earlier. <coughs> Which is more, you know, it, uh, the rights-based approach is these are the rights, this is what we should get. Um, and then there is uh, the realistic group more uh, this c saying, okay, th we should get what we can get. There are things that are impossible. Do you think Israel is going to accept all those re refugees to return and then to stop becoming a Jewish state? Of course not. So let's not, let's not have that goal. And let's have a realistic goal, maybe a Palestinian state in 1967 borders. Uh, that is more realistic to, act to, uh, 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 to take. And let's talk about the symbolic, maybe, return of some refugees, etc. These are the two major schools. And each one of them obviously has good reasons to exist. Uh, the rights-based approach is uh, from the human rights school and advocates. And, and the realistic is more people who have maybe more uh, political, uh, polit uh, realistic political uh, thinking. Uh, take what you can. If something is impossible, it's impossible. It's a um, normal uh, type of division that can exist in any society. But then there is also um, a group, another a third group, and a third uh, uh, school. Uh, it's not a school, yeah. But it's a third stream that is coming out, which is more uh, trying to think about transitional justice. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard, who has heard of transitional justice? Who knows something about transitional justice? Who knows nothing about transitional justice? Okay, so transitional justice is a framework uh, of, um, that has been used in different countries around the world um, that helps a state or a society to overcome gross human rights violations that had taken place before, during a conflict or during a time of uh, uh, oppression, dictatorship, uh, uh, oppressive regime. Um, its goal, the goal of a transitional justice approach is to uh, tackle the human rights issues, to give solutions to the human rights issues. And there are usually a, a, num a number of mechanisms that are uh, affiliated with this uh, uh, regime, with this uh, uh, framework of, uh, of thought and of action. And these mechanisms are truth-seeking, first one. It's, there's a belief that you need to find the truth first and to seek it from the victims and give <coughs> the victim a central position. The second one is accountability for crimes, courts, uh, or amnesty, and we're going to discuss this or more. The third one is reparations. And the fourth one is state reform, reform of state institutions and reform of the legal system. <coughs> uh, this is more of a comprehensive uh, 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 school. But when this school started growing in the Israeli academia, it uh, started growing in the wrong direction somehow. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. 
uh, at least to my judgment and to my feeling, right? I don't need to. Uh, um, it it focuses a lot on truth, truth commissions, uh, seeking truth, and it um, ignores maybe, maybe intentionally. I believe maybe not intentionally. Uh, the issues like right of return and uh, restitution. And this is the whole reason why I wanted to actually explore this further. And, uh, Wait, I don't understand. You're saying that in Israel they went more to the issue of truth rather than... Truth. But who, <coughs> does, who, who is seeking truth? Uh, no, no, the academics. Academics. I'm uh -huh. not saying Israel, Israel. Israel is not seeking truth. The academics will go more <laughs> on... <laughs> no, 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 I understand, but I, I... Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, it's an interesting question, of course. but I mean, not the government, the academics. Some academics that yeah, I... Yeah, because some academics, I think. Not some, a few academics, not not many academics, it's just a few handful of articles. It's not even a big literature, uh, it's just a few articles, nothing... Uh, it's a new stream of thought, we don't, we don't have even enough literature. On uh, uh, on transitional justice, it's a very it's very new for Palestinians, for Israelis, mm -hmm. for everybody here. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I will also talk about the Zohrot Initiative, uh, which is going to help in this. Uh Do, does this model itself on what happened in South Africa? Uh, uh, an example on transitional justice is South Africa, and there are <coughs> dozens of other examples. I'm just wondering if what you meant by. They, they focus more on seeking truth and ignore issues of, of like, like the right of return is that they want to hear stories, but that it's less focused on remedies? Yes, that's true. Okay, is, is that what you... This is precise, yes. Okay. This is precisely what I meant. Okay. And I think this is intentional uh, because also there's the issue of the Jewish state. Look, we cannot always uh, forg forget the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Jewish state. No, no. the elephant in the room. Right? It's the Jewish state, um, and and this is this is why this is why this is an issue. If millions of refugees are going to be allowed to return and might return, and maybe maybe half of them, maybe one quarter of them will decide to return, still it's significant. Um, the Jewish state is afraid that it will lose its Jewish character, right? And those who believe <coughs> in the Jewish state and in the importance of having a Jewish state are afraid that it will lose its character. Some of these people like to know that this state is becoming more progressive, recognizes its uh, mistakes, but at the same time don't want to see a return, an actual return. They felt, some of them apparently felt that an apology will do the, the issue, you know, it will be transitional justice. This is what we did, we're sorry, let's go on with our lives. And then this was actually my question of the whole thesis. Is what is this actually uh, enough? Is this transitional justice? Uh, there was even a suggestion uh, from uh, two authors that this is actually transitional justice does not need all the remedies. Who what it actually requires. Who? Sorry. Who are these two? Uh, Yoav Peled and Nadim Rohana. Uh, they wrote a good paper. Relatively, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good paper. It's uh, <laughs> um, it's it's enjoyable to read. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, I, um, I felt from the paper, um, um, and it's available online, um, that um, the author suggested uh, that tr truth is <coughs> more significant, <coughs> more important, uh, um, and that transitional justice does not necessarily seek to uh, uh, to compensate and to to offer reparations, but it more seeks things like truth and apology. Mm -hmm. This was the suggestion. So that got me to explore the field of transitional justice more and try to understand uh, whether this is actually uh, true or not. Uh, but I want first to start by the basis of, uh, of remedies. Where do the remedies come from? And you know, lawyers are boring. We always want to seek, to, to dig into the roots of things from a legal point of view, especially when it comes to do with refugees, displaced, all of this. It's true that it's a political discussion, but it is originally a legal discussion. Uh, legal discussion. Uh, so uh, bringing out the roots 
of, uh, of, of patterns, of remedies, of solutions is very important. And the roots, in the way I, I found, was there was this idea of state responsibility. There is a law, international law, called the law of state responsibility. Every internationally wrongful act of a state entails the international responsibility of that state. Right? International responsibility. So if a state violates international law, this makes the state responsible. Okay? Um, what is uh, the goal? What, should, what does the uh, uh, law of state responsibility aim at? To wipe out all the consequences of an illegal act. If an illegal act happens, you need to wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act. How does that happen? First, you seize the act. It sounds natural to you, right? Seize the act. Stop the illegal act. But then think about Oslo again and Camp David. How come the negotiators did not tell Israel, we are starting now with a peace process, at least before we make sure the refugees return and discuss all these issues, stop displacement. This never happened, unfortunately. Big deficiency in our peace process as you managed to see, as we saw in the previous presentation. <laughs> we did not do the first simple thing, which is to make sure we stop the act. <coughs> Co displacement is continuous. Now we have the term continuous Nakba, ongoing Nakba, right? Then you offer appropriate assurances and guarantees for non-repetition. Natural also, natural. <coughs> the state responsible does not so we started talking about all the re return and all of these things before seeking the even earlier stage stopping and offering guarantees uh, and assurances for non-repetition how do we offer assurances and guarantees of non-repetition there are several methods, and we're going to go through them, through some examples. But the whole goal, the whole, the whole issue is about non-repetition. The whole issue is about not inflicting more pain and more suffering on more people. Before even, Cessation. Before even giving cure <laughs> to the harmed persons, you stop causing harm to new persons. This is forgotten in the peace process, in the negotiations, in the discussions. This does not exist on the table at all. No, but when they say to stop uh, to stop the building in the, in the West Bank, etc., etc., this is uh, probably what, what they're talking about, not to continue. See, this is what I also worry about, is that it's all, all the discussion is always about the settlements, which is okay, it's, it's important. That's but what about the individuals, the people, yeah. me, you? us, the, pe the people. Why do the people have to continue to be victims? Why do we still revoke residencies? Why do we still uh, 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 have homes demolition, demolished every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the, pe the person, the individual, the human, why is the, the, that individual ignored in the whole process? It's something that actually uh, I find uh, Crazy, and this is not the way it works in the whole world, by the way. It worked here; it doesn't work like that. But how do you explain it? <coughs> how do you explain that now, even now, there is no insistence on all, on all these, on, on other than uh, stopping the building the settlements? Human rights was not a priority on the agenda of, the Palestinians. of anybody, of the Palestinians and the Israelis. Israelis, of course. It was. It has not been a priority. And it's still not a priority. The priority has been, let's get to a solution, let's create a state, nation, flag, um, uh, patriots, um, this uh, type of uh, discussion, more pa nationalistic discussion. It's more into my flag and your flag, my territory, your territory, this. 
It's also Israel never assumed responsibility, right? They didn't say we displace people. No, of course. We are controlling the territory and we're people are displaced because because they are. But the Palestinians <laughs> believe they they didn't insist on it either. That's yeah, I'm going to actually. Maybe Israel is the Palestinians. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the denial in actually uh, two slides from here. Um, but then, <coughs> according to the law of state responsibility. Then there is the idea of restitution. There is a hierarchy of, uh, there is the idea of reparations. Reparations, and it's important always to also um, translate reparations and understand reparations with the uh, comprehensive concept of it. Reparations in Arabic, Jabr al In Hebrew, what is it in Hebrew? <laughs> tikkun? Tikkun is it? Reparations. No. 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 So this is exactly the point. Tikkun. So reparations is tikkun in general. It consists of three elements in English. Uh, the first one is restitution. And restitution means the state's obligation to re-establish which existed before the wrongful act was committed. Tamam? To return the situation as it used to be before the act was committed. Restore. Restore it. Right? If we're talking about displacement, what does that mean? How do you, uh, what is restitution? The people come back. That the person comes back. Yeah, if the person... Uh, rebuild the 500 and so villages. Sorry? Rebuild the 500 and so villages. And bring the people, and bring the people back. Rebuild, rebuild cities, rebuild villages. Okay. And expel others. No. No? No. I'm not asking. <laughs> no, and that's something I'm going to talk about. Yeah. No. So, expel others who came to be in their place? No. That's the answer of this is not yes. It's not yes, it's there is discussion about it. I will get to that discussion uh, later. But this is generally what, uh, what it is. Then, in cases where restitution is impossible, or, or be beyond, where is the text? Um, or involves a burden out of all proportion. Iowa, yes, this is what I was looking for. Yeah. Involves a burden out of all proportion. Then there is another remedy called compensation. That's bit sweet. Right? Compensation. Ta'weed. Ta'weed. Because if you come and talk to refugees about ta'weed, they will shout. Usually. This happens a lot. When I invite a speaker, and the speaker says reparations, and the translator, the simultaneous translation, mm -hmm. says ta'weed, my listeners are angry. Mm -hmm. So usually, yeah. when a translator comes, when I'm organizing an event, I tell the translator, look, if the guy says reparations, please translate this as jabr al dalar tikkun, maybe. If he says ta'weed, says compensation. But if you just say compensation, they will say, what about the right of return? So we need, you know, this is a sensitive issue even for Palestinians especially. No, but there is a price of return, <coughs> not exactly in the same place, but just near. And compensation. I mean, does every refugee get angry even if he knows, for example, that his home doesn't exist anymore and there, there is a university? In this example, case, now... I mean, he will be ready, I guess, to get compensation and get another place near or wherever yeah. he chooses, I guess. There Most is, yeah. Here there is, there is discussion, I'm going to get to that more, um, <coughs> but obviously if a house is destroyed, you cannot give back the same house because it doesn't exist. Exactly. So you need to do some sort of compensation, yeah. whether it is financial or whether it is to build something instead. Mm -hmm. If it's in the same place, if it's impossible somewhere else nearby, of course, it's not so strict. You don't come and destroy everything and, uh, uh, and <coughs> we're not going to reverse the clock into pre-1948. We're going to uh, give reparations, mm -hmm. right? The third one is called satisfaction. <coughs> the third remedy in the uh, scope of reparations is called satisfaction, which is also usually forgotten, by the way. Uh, it is certainly forgotten in the case of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, uh, like many other things that are forgotten. Uh, but it is also... Um, an issue, you know, it's also an element that is not uh, very much uh, stressed upon. What does satisfaction mean? 
it may, it may consist in an acknowledgement of the breach, an expression of regret, a formal apology, or another appropriate modality. So this is what uh, satisfaction is about. It's about an apology, acknowledgement. It has value in international law. Huge. It has value. Huge. Not only, of course, it comes from our human nature. We want an apology. We want... Uh, when I do something wrong to one of you, I would apologize to you and I will hope that you accept my apology. This is human nature. And this has been translated into international law, even. It's called satisfaction, one of the modalities. Extremely healing. Of course it is healing. It's really healing. But it comes as part of a bigger remedy and they usually go together. This is the basis of the whole transitional justice concept, by the way. Transitional justice does not come from space. It comes from international law. It's come from normal people having suffered normal things and having wanted to, to get normal compensation, normal reparations on, uh, on, on, on uh, regarding their, their victimhood. <coughs> what happened? Now, the other type of responsibility that can come out is individual criminal responsibility. And in this case, we're not talking about state responsibility. In that, in state responsibility, it is the state that should actually stop the act, guarantee uh, that this doesn't get repeated again, and then offer reparations with the three elements of reparations. Individual responsibility is about individuals. And this is what started in Nuremberg after uh, uh, the fall of the Nazi regime in the Second World War. <coughs> um, the Nuremberg tribunals punished individuals. It did not punish Germany. Obviously, Germany had to pay its share on uh, 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 the violations that happened during the, uh, uh, the Nazi regime. But also individuals were also prosecuted as, as individuals because crimes are conducted by individuals. When somebody pulls the trigger, that individual is responsible. When somebody displaces somebody, that individual is responsible for that action. Even if the legal system in the country allows this, nobody can make an argument in front of an international tribunal that according to the domestic legal system, this was legal. Therefore, you know, it's very important sometimes not to be part of the system because the system, if the system is forcing you to perpetrate war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, you are responsible as an individual. Each one of us is responsible. You cannot make an argument that I was under a system that actually made experiments on individuals, for example, a doctor that made experiments on, on people. You cannot say that th it was legal. But Even if it's legal. Today, when uh, uh, Israeli officers go abroad and they are person, they, they are known to be personally responsible uh, in involvement in, uh, uh, you know, in, in um, war, <coughs> war crimes. War, yeah, war crimes. Yes. And other, c I, I think, what, what was it in England? They couldn't come to England, or a number of countries where they. Spain, England. Spain or this is called the universal jurisdiction. It is the, uh, uh. the point before the last. Yeah, so okay. there are several countries. There are several types of prosecutions, jurisdiction. There are like Nuremberg, Tokyo, like the ICTY, the International Criminal Court uh, Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, or ICTR on Rwanda, <coughs> or the Special Court on Sierra Leone. These are specific country, uh, 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 courts created for specific jurisdictions. Uh, on specific acts at specific periods of time, ad hoc. Then we have the International Criminal Court, which is more universal, but it has certain rules according on, on its uh, uh, jurisdiction. But then we have something called the Universal Jurisdiction. And this is what you were referring to. A state, like Britain, like Spain, like Belgium, uh, can say, we, as a state, have jurisdiction over any crime that happens in anywhere around the world, regardless of who is the perpetrator, regardless of who is the victim, and regardless of who, of where the crime happened, 
if this crime was a war crime, a crime against humanity, or a genocide. This is called universal jurisdiction, because usually, if you commit a normal crime, a normal crime, let's say you, um, you know, somebody steals something, steals something here, somebody steals something, robs a house. <coughs> The, the, if the perpetrator is, let's say, Israeli, and the victim is Israeli, uh, usually only the Israeli court has jurisdiction over this. If you, if the victim will go to France, there is no jurisdiction. But certain countries decided that, regardless of who is the perpetrator or the victim or where the crime has happened, I have jurisdiction. And this is what was sought, actually, by Palestinians at some point. They tried to pr prosecute Sharon, Ariel Sharon, in Belgium. Uh, some people, it worked for some people. I mean, uh, Pinochet, the uh, Chilean dictator, was prosecuted in Spain and in Britain uh, for uh, crimes against humanity. So it is possible. It happened before, but it never happened for Israel. It, uh, Israel uh, was all, there were always political I factors. <coughs> happening whenever uh, prosecution was uh, not. But there were uh, arrest warrants. Uh, Which countries? Only England and Spain? <coughs> no, there is more. Belgium used to be. I'm not sure if it still is. I think it might have changed that after Sharon, actually. Uh, Spain, what is else? Spain has changed. I mean, the yeah. evening has reached an agreement with the Spanish government. Okay. Yeah. But uh, there was an Israeli general who wasn't allowed to get off the plane. Yeah. I mean, who did, couldn't get off the plane. Anymore. In London, in London. <coughs> yes, that was an Israeli guy. Yeah. I think anyway, every office in England They amended it and made it and, and made the procedure more difficult. Uh, they somehow made it more political that you need more acceptance from uh, other authorities in order to charge mm -hmm. someone. So they didn't cancel it, but they also gave it some political. That, that they can actually decide who they want to charge and who they don't want to charge. So it's not only upon evidence, upon presenting evidence. Now it needs some, I don't <laughs> know exactly how it changed, but I know that it is more, it made, they made it more complicated mm -hmm. in order to make sure that people that they don't want to prosecute will not be prosecuted. Because important people can be charged. I mean, after the occupation of Iraq, there were important uh, American officials who could have been charged for war crimes mm -hmm. and crimes against humanity. But Obviously, who's going to arrest, uh, you know, uh, American uh, foreign min uh, defense minister or uh, it's, uh, it's no. so <coughs> and we all know that the, um, same the same people are going to arrest an Israeli foreign minister. Or defense exactly, minister. You know, that's that's the point. Unfortunately, the international uh, justice criminal system is very corrupt with political considerations. Uh, it's not, there is no rule of law in the international sphere. There is uh, law. Some people are punished, some people are not. This is the reality now. And also every officer now has his lawyer and even before they went for their war during the summer, they had all their very sophisticated lawyers uh, trying to put it that way that everything they are going to do is legal in fact. Yes. So they are afraid because they know that not so easy to get. Of course. Yeah, but more than that, actually, if people have seen this uh, movie, which is called uh, The Law in This Part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So one thing you see, which which amazed me, even, is that uh, this whole system of uh, rules in the, in the occupation uh, was designed, uh, actually it was designed before the occupation happened, and it yeah. was designed have, having international law in mind. I mean, those things, th those people thought they managed to twist international law in a way that they get away with it. Yeah. And they didn't amazing. have, they didn't have any enforcement of international law. They were not worried about enforcement mm -hmm. of international law. Actually now you will yeah, find, yeah. they will find that there is a little bit more worry about the enforcement uh, of international law. Um, ideas of uh, mass displacements are also more thought about now in Israel because of fear of an in the international criminal court having jurisdiction. It's now we, we can be very close to uh, international criminal co court jurisdiction. Actually, the decision now is in the hand of the PLO yeah. to give jurisdiction. Today, it is in the hands of the PLO. If the PLO decides today to give international criminal court jurisdiction, 
tomorrow it will have jurisdiction and it can start prosecuting any war criminal, not only Israeli, also Palestinian war criminals. Uh, no, any Palestinian war criminal, any Israeli war criminal can become uh, subject to the court if we give jurisdiction in the West Bank and Gaza. Wow. Yeah, of course. This is it is. I, I will talk. I was. I'm supposed to talk about it also. Um, universal. No, universal jurisdiction is not in the hands of the PLO. The punitive measures? Yeah, like well, of course, measures, because punitive measures in universal jurisdiction, <coughs> the punitive measures in the universal jurisdiction is up to every individual state that has a universal jurisdiction uh, clause in its criminal code. So this is universal jurisdiction is domestic. It's a domestic law for each state that adopts it. So it could be British, it could be Belgian, it could be Spanish, it could be whatever it was, according to the law of every state. Uh, the International Criminal Court is an international uh, body that has one criminal code and one code of uh, punishments and penalties and all of this. So it doesn't depend on the individual states. But it only works to indict the criminal or does it, act, does it bring back remedies? No, it doesn't bring back remedies. Okay. No. It mainly works on criminal issues. That's it, yes. Uh, so the framework of transitional justice, again, truth and acknowledgement, policy uh, regarding criminal responsibility, reparations, and reforming state institutions. And for me, to be honest, I am uh, stressing the last one. Uh, despite the fact that in negotiations we always talk about reparations, we always talk about uh, other things, but uh, reforming state institutions, I feel, is not even is not even in the discussions. And here I'm not talking only about the Palestinian, the Israeli state institutions. I also talk about if there is a Palestinian state one day, if that this needs to be, we need to also make sure that the the, the institutions of this state are working according to certain uh, standards of human rights, obviously. But let's start with truth commissions. And here, I see that time is running, and uh, I should try to go quickly with, uh, with some of the ideas that I want to share. The first idea is that, as we all uh, maybe ha know already, and as we maybe discussed in several uh, 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 opportunities during this course, uh, Israel denies. Who said that now? You mentioned it early, just now at the beginning, that Israel denies, there is denial of the whole issue of displacement. Israel doesn't say we are displacing, right? In the first place. Uh, um, and I could manage to find a few uh, uh, um, forms, ex uh, expressions of denial <coughs> in a few years. One of them is the explicit denial. When Israel says we do not... We have not displaced people. They actually are the ones who uh, fled. It was the Arab countries that forced the refugees to leave in 1948. And we shouldn't reward them by allowing them to come back. Um, it's, uh, it's a speech, it's the official narrative of the state, which is also expressed by individuals and academics and authors and uh, people who are professors who teach in universities repeat this narrative and this mantra, if you want. Um, another one is the secret laws somehow. Uh, you remember when we mentioned, in the West Bank especially, in the, in the West Bank and Gaza, Israel worked according to laws that nobody knows. We, we saw the effect of that when we, for example, with child registration restrictions in the West Bank. It's everything, or with family unification, or with all these things, everything happened without even knowing what, according to which law this is happening. When Israel, for example, started revoking the residences of Palestinians in Jerusalem after 1994, after the peace process started and after the West Bank and Gaza became some type of a special territory under a special ruling system, and suddenly they became abroad, there was no announcement of a law that says now, from now on, if you live in Hebron or in Ramallah or in this or that place, 
you are living abroad and you will lose your residency. Suddenly we started discovering that people were losing their residencies. What, uh, uh, what happened? Well, they are living abroad, but they have been living in that place for the last 30 years or whatever. So they were not considered, uh, now they are abroad. Right. No, this is the policy. They didn't make Jerusalem the center of their life. Exactly, but this yeah. wasn't the case before 1994. I have relatives who were in Gaza, yeah. uh, like, uh, you know, uh, people who lived in Gaza for a long time and they kept their ID card. After Oslo, they had to, <coughs> they have to, they had to, they lost their residency status. You know, you could live in Gaza with your blue ID card and things were fine. But after Oslo, Gaza became abroad. Ramallah became abroad. The neighborhoods around Jerusalem became abroad. And this was secret. It wasn't something that was announced. You know, law should be announced. Law should be announced loudly uh, before it takes effect. This is يعني, uh, one of the most basic and simple principles of law that it should be public because you should not be losing such important rights and such important things before even knowing how you can keep them or lose them. Um, the third one is blaming the victim, for example. I remember I went through the Shaheen case two weeks ago maybe when we discussed uh, 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 the, that guy who was in Gaza and participated in the uh, in the census, but he uh, uh, allegedly had been in Saudi Arabia and then Jordan. He was a student of pharmacy, if I remember right. I think it was pharmacy or what? Uh, and he entered uh, 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 Gaza, and he was uh, accused of becoming an inf of being an infiltrator, and a deportation order was put against him. And according to the court. It was his, the court said, it was his act of infiltration that caused his displacement. It's not that the law is shit <laughs> or that, uh, you know, it's, it's his act of infiltration. Imagine you being <coughs> in that place where you are blamed for your faith. It's all the house demolitions. I mean, you built a house without a permit. It's you because you disobeyed the law that we're building and you have to pay a fine and you have to pay for the bulldozer that actually demolished your house. Right? You remember? Yeah. yeah. At, uh, Jeff said that. Mm -hmm. You pay for it because it's your mistake. Mm. The Nakba law is another form of... Uh, 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 what happened with the case with Zukhrot and uh, the cinematic? No, we don't know yet. We might have a new victim of the, of the denial. No, you think it's true? It there is... They filed a complaint for the... Uh, so a few years ago, Israel issued a law, which is unofficially known as the <coughs> Nakba law, which ac according to this law, uh, any <coughs> institution that uh, um, conducts an event that commemorates the day of independence of Israel as, an, as a day of mourning, shall not be allowed to receive public funding. This was called the Nakba law. And obviously the historical, the history of the legislation of this law was basically about institutions that commemorate the Nakba, which is basically the Israeli independence from a Palestinian point of view, obviously, right? Nakba, catastrophe. Uh, we talked about Nakba before. Uh, so it's called the Nakba law from a, in an in official uh, uh, way. And the last potential victim for this law will be Cinematic of Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. uh, because of Zukhro, the very organization we are sitting in right now, uh, and its film festival. Uh, because it has films, it, well, the films are about the Nakba, basically, and are about the displacement. So there is discussion but no, now. But, uh, but it's, it's uh, I think, in this particular. It's ridiculous. But yeah, I know, it sounds ridiculous because, they, uh, because talking about the Nakba doesn't necessarily mean that you explicitly see a day of independence as a day of uh, or a morning. I mean, they have to prove that giving this, uh, talking about the Nakba entails explicitly mourning about the, I mean, of course it can be implicit in it, but you no, have no, to- No, no, but the whole idea of a law, of enacting a law 
in order yeah, to on, get yeah. people not to say something or if to prevent them from the reward of your of the public funding if it's a school for example imagine a palestinian school in the north in the galilee and they Discuss, they're not allowed to discuss Nakba anymore, public schools. No, uh, it's mainly against Palestinian institutions. No, it's I mean, I'd want, to, I'd want to highlight, I mean, even though the law is pending before the Supreme Court, still not an answer, etc., but it is having its effects in, I mean, I think there's probably one organization that's definitely going to be affected by it. I mean, if, you know, there's someone in the Knesset kind of keeping an eye on them, which I'm sure they are, <laughs> sorry. Um, but you've also had other cases like uh, this year, uh, we had, there was some um, so uh, students that, I mean, I, yeah, there's like comments made by uh, politicians, but also like at Haifa University this year, in May, uh, the Arab University, uh, the Arab students tried to, like they wanted to have like a small, like one hour, two hours sort of a commemoration on campus uh, for the Nakba, but uh, the dean of the students uh, denied them, uh, you know, the permission to do it. But they went ahead anyway, they said, no, it's all right, we should be able to have this. And then two of the lead, two of the student leaders got expelled, and the Arab student clubs on ca were banned from uh, from uh, mm -hmm. having any activities for like the rest of the year. We had to go to court. We had to kind of defend them and try to overturn it. But it's precisely whereby you have, even though the law is still kind of you know up in the air, it's gi it, it gives enough space for. But legally, is there a basis for this? I mean, essentially, the law is in it's an action, like it's an action, even though it's, yeah, the, the law is basically. Yeah. But it's not in the law. It's what not the law. It's what you're saying no, 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 is that the, the, the intimidation of the yeah, law is No, no, the law was enacted in 2011. It, even though it's pending in the Supreme Court, technically the law is legal. Like it, it, but it's the law of now, now, even, now, yes, it has its chilling effect, but if they want to, if these administrations or whatever wanted to keep going with this legally, uh, they could just say, yeah, this is the natural law, and it says we would get, uh, you know, the state would pull out its funding if uh, we had any confirmation of it. So if they want to go further, you could, but the idea is <coughs> to create this chilling effect, which allows the practices to take place. Uh, so the Nakba uh, so law both sets the legal uh, foundations, and it provides that sort of social space to yeah, uh, carry out action. I think it's the from education. Yeah. 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 People are more afraid about talking about the Nakba, yeah. doing something, not just even commemorate, yeah. but even just discussing. Yeah, teaching about it, discussing it, doing something because they're afraid mm. it will affect, it but will be implemented. According to the law, it's only if you see it's Israel. It's true, but it's still there the social effect of the law, and the not law. just the law. Okay. Uh, but the law is legal. The law is legal. Yeah. And you can still argue it in court. If you wanted to <laughs> kind of harass the student, you can go to court and say, uh, ah, they yeah, they went. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and the uh, Adala Adala agree, they went and yeah, they went. Yeah, they went. And the, yeah. and the court said that uh, the it's, it's legal. Maybe there will be like, the it, it still yeah. didn't uh, be implemented. Yeah. So they couldn't say anything yeah, about so it. But the they said it's yeah, yeah. Th they said they said that the law it's, it's too true. early to tell that the law really does have yeah. an effect or an impact. <laughs> therefore we won't decide it. And the Supreme <laughs> Court uses this tactic yeah. with other laws, saying, Oh, it's too soon, uh, let it keep going and we'll figure it out. And let's see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> it looks very democratic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, another form of denial. We have several forms of denial. Another one is in the peace process itself. The peace process that the Palestinians are part of. There is lots of denial. And the texts that I shared with you today, to be honest with you, I feel they are texts of denial. Especially if you compare them with the rest of the world. In the Bosnian peace process, where there was something called the right of return. Right? That one, it's called. Here we're talking about modalities of admission. People who lost their ID cards and how we're going to give them back their ID, to reissue the ID card. Surely lost their ID card. How come? You know, like, uh, the whole language is also language of denial. In the peace, in the peace texts, not to mention the other. I don't know about denial, but it's, it's a, a phrase <coughs> only used for Jewish re uh, return. Yeah. <coughs> the term return is only, yes, it's only for, there is something called the law of return. Yeah. So somebody, Jewish, who was displaced 2,000 years ago, his grand, 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 <coughs> grandchildren can come back in return. But a Palestinian who was displaced <coughs> yesterday, he doesn't uh, have and he prove. manages to get his uh, reissuance of an ID card if he qualifies according to this or that. <coughs> But the word return has never been used even for Palestinians. But you know, he doesn't even have to prove that he's grand, grand, grand. No, no, of course not. He just yeah. proved that you're Jewish. So it's, you know. Um, 
but there are two positive elements in, <coughs> uh, in, in the Israeli context. Um, and these positive elements are, first, that Israel started declassifying parts of its archives. And this has allowed me, in the very first meeting with you, to actually share with you the history of the Nakba from an Israeli archival and res arch research uh, point of view, right? Not only from Palestinian historians, so that you would tell me maybe your Palestinian law, uh, historians were lying. Here we, you know, we have Israeli archival information that we can use to understand what actually happened from an Israeli eye, from an Israeli eye. The second one, which is quite important and quite significant, is the Freedom of Information Act, which is now being used frequently uh, uh, among uh, especially Israeli human rights organizations to, to uh, come out with uh, information that has been hidden for... Uh, yes, for decades. <coughs> for example, the, this number that I told you, that from the West Bank and Gaza excluding East Jerusalem, to a, a quarter a million persons were displaced. We only knew it maybe three years ago or something. Through a case that was filed by Hamoked, an Israeli human rights organization, using the Freedom of Information Act. So we, s we, ha we now have another tool for knowledge, to know that some truths. But what is the problem? There is lack of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. We can get knowledge. We can advance in knowledge. Not all the knowledge, by the way. Don't be fooled also. <laughs> Not all the knowledge. We have some <coughs> knowledge, relatively better knowledge, that we can reach through the system. And some of it is not available yet. But we lack acknowledgement. Um, acknowledgement is an acceptance that this, is, this <coughs> happened and this was wrong. Do you ever hear that something is wrong here? We don't, I, I haven't. If somebody hears, please tell me. <laughs> we always hear that everything here is great. Um, acknowledgement. We don't have acknowledgement on Nakba. We don't have acknowledgement of uh, all the other displacements. Uh, uh, we continue, everything is always explained that this is what the legal system says. This person has been displaced because this person has disobeyed the law and done one, two, three. This house has been demolished because it was built illegally and without a permit. It's all, everything is explained as if it is uh, the way it should be. But even on the biggest scale, right? It's like, it's all, it, all of this is, I feel like the biggest blaming of the victim is it all happened because of the not accepting the partition plan, right? So that's like the big one. Yeah, in the, in, in the first place. <laughs> Remember, it was one person, was it Shamir or someone said, why should, you know, why should we take responsibility for their mistakes? And it was like the big, it was the big picture issue. The big like, picture. You know, we wanted peace, we wanted, you know, so it's that, though it's, yes, it's those individual cases and it's the big. Yes. The big picture. But even if you have acknowledgement, like the one I told you about. Yes. Lafayette done speaking in Uda, saying in plain Hebrew. This That's is what I did. Exactly. It is never, uh, th there, is, there isn't a sense of um, remorse. There's no sense of, well, we should have done better by then, or I'm sorry about it. There is an assurance, I did it, and I did it for something that I am not sorry for. Yes. I did it for the greater good of Israel, whatever. Yes, I know that this exists. The acknowledgement that I'm talking about is the acknowledgement that comes out of like truth commissions in different places. In places like Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, East Timur, uh, uh, and many other places. They dispatch a truth commission. The truth commission is built by the state, but has some independence from the government financial, administrative, etc. It's an, an independent committee in the state. It investigates what happened. It looks for not only displacement, for all human rights violations that took place during a certain period of time that is defined by a law. They meet victims, they ask victims, they meet perpetrators and ask them what happened, how did it happen, why did it happen. Not only what happened, how and why. Who did it? Who was the victim? Who was the perpetrator? They understand the picture. And then they write a report telling us what happened. 
they ask the state to acknowledge what happened. And the state acknowledges what happened with a formal, clear language and takes responsibility. In South Africa, South Africa, the post-apartheid system acknowledged everything that happened and took responsibility, state responsibility on what happened. So truth is not only just to know the truth. It's not only for the, the knowledge of it. It's also for the acknowledgement of it. It's also for the taking responsibility part. The state has, it, the state apologizes for all the victims. Not the victims of one part over the other, by the way. To all the victims. Didn't uh, uh, Ehud Barak issue a few years ago an apology? To, to the Mizrahi Jews. <laughs> no, to the Mishpacha. Of course. Okay, oh, sorry, my mistake. And it was ridiculous too. <laughs> but uh, but uh, once this uh, <coughs> I feel something, uh, you see, with your juxtaposition of knowledge versus acknowledgement, you go to the very roots of the conflict. Because uh, Zohrot has uh, testimonies of, of soldiers who were perpetrators of the Nakba in, in 48. Uh, you may have seen them on their website. <coughs> but some of them would say, actually, we did all this, but we had no choice. You know, we had to do it. If we hadn't done it, there wouldn't have been a uh, Jewish state in yes. Palestine. So it goes to the very root of the thing that a Jewish state in Palestine is a good thing to, to, yeah. to be. And there was no other way of, uh, of achieving it. <coughs> and that's where the, I mean, even people who, who tell the truth about what happened, they said, OK, this happened. I mean, in every single village, yeah. you, you almost have testimonies. I mean, you don't have testimonies about every single village. Do you? You don't have no, testimonies about reason. every single place, but we have <laughs> many testimonies. Yeah, and but next week we... <coughs> but some people say, yeah, I know, but some people say, okay, we did it, but we had no choice. That's. I but mean, also, it's not the acknowledgement of the individuals only, although this is important, ah, and this is therapeutic, <coughs> okay. but it's not only that. What we are seeking here is the acknowledgement of the state representing okay. the whole society, and this is yeah. not shameful. No, okay. This is not shameful to anyone. This is a source of pride to anybody to acknowledge the mistake. Yeah, and wait, wait until Israel is defeated sometimes or the, US or the USA drops it. I don't <laughs> know. <coughs> yeah. okay. I don't know how this will happen, but uh, we're talking about the, uh, the standards. Uh, I will skip this slide. It's about uh, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation <coughs> Commission in Sierra Leone, but I see uh, that I have only a few minutes. I, this was an example of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission regarding displacement uh, of uh, more than two million people in a conflict, in a civil conflict. Um, but I will skip this. And there has been, you know, again, just simply here, this is just one quote about the importance of uh, a Truth Commission here. We already have <coughs> Uh, a literature of some of the authors trying to argue that we need truth commissions. Uh, but obviously, truth commissions are not important. The other issue that we need to care about is prosecutions. Prosecutions here, uh, uh, we have two uh, general theories. In general, in law, in the legal thought. One of them is restorative justice and one of them is retributive justice. According to the idea of restorative justice, the idea is we don't need to punish. Punishment of a criminal does not help. Uh, it's better to give the criminal uh, the opportunity to participate in compensating the victim. And in that way, becoming part of the remedy, part of the, uh, 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 of, of the whole reparation uh, uh, process. That's one theory. Obviously, the other theory is retributive justice. It says somebody makes a crime, you punish the crime, that's the criminal. Retributive justice is certainly has been dominant in criminal laws in the whole world until today, since the beginning of history until now. But the idea of restorative justice came into being again uh, when the discussion of transitional justice and truth commissions came. Uh, uh, there was always a will to give amnesties to perpetrators. 
especially in order to uh, move towards uh, peace to convince people in power that you will not be in jail tomorrow you can reach peace and you will have an amnesty for, what, for the terrible things you have done South Africa was an example of that obviously this is not it's important to know that this is not in accordance with, in accordance with international law for example the United Nations uh, explicitly uh, now uh, states that it doesn't recognize amnesty for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other violations of uh, international humanitarian law. Um, and it's also important to mention that some states in their internal domestic legal systems prosecute war crimes and crimes against humanity, including displacement. We mentioned last week the example of Estonia, how it actually punishes, uh, how it punished even a case that went as far back as 1949. And Colombia also has a criminal code that punishes war crimes and crimes against humanity. This can be adopted at any time. In all cases, crime, war crimes and crimes against humanity do not have statute of limitations. This means it's never too late to prosecute somebody who perpetrated a war crime or a crime against humanity or genocide. Even if the crime happened, you know, 50 years ago or more. As long as the person is alive, the person can be prosecuted. When they die, obviously, tell us. Too late. Um, now the fourth one is reparations, and reparations here we need to always understand it in uh, the third one is reparations in its big concept and in, in its big understanding. Reparation means uh, getting the situation as it used to be before the conflict, before the violation. It includes all the three elements of restitution, compensation, satisfaction. But then about restitution, we, it's important to mention this. What happens when you give back property to a person? What happens to what are called secondary occupants? Mm -hmm. A person who lives in the house, for example, in the same house where a person was displaced from, or uh, so this is an issue of discussion, generally in international law. And there is uh, a set of principles that uh, called Pinheiro principles. And Pinheiro was uh, uh, a rapporteur at the United Nations who was asked to write principles about return after uh, uh, the Bosnian experience. And according to the principles, uh, the states should ensure that safeguards of due process are extended to secondary occupants. Uh, they should not uh, prejudice the rights of legitimate owners, tenants, and other right holders <coughs> to repossess their housing, uh, land, and property in question in a just and timely manner. So basically, there are two things. On the one hand, there is still a right to the original owner to his or her house and her property. But at the same time, you cannot arbitrarily displace the person who, live, who lives currently in the house. There needs to be a process a judicial process that will decide. And usually, you can also extend compensation to the, to the secondary occupant in a certain way. Every country has sought uh, some, uh, that sought to, to, to return has sought uh, 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 some sort of, uh, of, of remedy. But in general, the original owner of a house, of a property, has title to it. But this doesn't mean we displace uh, we make a big, a new big displacement. There always needs to be, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the actual return to the actual houses. Now, if a village has been destroyed, it's easy to rebuild something instead. Maybe not to build, you're not going to rebuild the same house, but maybe you rebuild a village in a different way. Obviously, the number of people have increased. You need to accommodate new people, etc. Uh, but. Um, uh, uh, the return of refugees, of displaced persons, doesn't mean that you start a new way of displacement. This is, also, this is certainly wrong. Some people have acquired rights, but on the specific house, if it still exists, the original owner has title. But it has to be resolved, with not arbitrarily. Not you come, the next day you kick out everybody <laughs> and you... Uh, no. Yeah. It needs to be due to due process in every... Uh, 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 I have a question. I mean, I, I'm not seeing this 
going to happen in any near future. Yes. <coughs> but uh, still, uh, I mean, have you thought about the uh, distinction between people who have just gotten those houses for free from the government? Or yes. <coughs> so uh, I'm talking about a Palestinian case. Yeah. And they knew it was a Palestinian house. Uh, and people who actually <laughs> bought their house with uh, full money from the government, yeah. from the Jewish National Fund. I have thought about them, but I don't have the full solutions because it's actually a very complicated issue. Yeah. Certainly, some people need to be compensated because they paid something that is not original. Th they bought something from somebody who's not an owner, but according to the system at that time, they were, they bought it. So they need compensation, but the title to the same land, they don't have it. So they probably should be compensated. But oh, by the way. The secondary occupants that we're talking about are not only Jews, you should remember. They are also Palestinian. There are many Palestinians that were moved to live in other Palestinian houses, and uh, you know, in, in houses that were from which Palestinians, other Palestinians were displaced. Whether it is in Israel itself, or in the West Bank, or, or Gaza. In many cases, it's relatives, it's family members, who somebody there was displaced, they took the house. What happens in that case? It's a very, very complicated issue. And I'm not saying that there is a very easy equation to, to deal with. But if you do, if we start a process with good intentions, I'm sure that we are going to find out a policy. We need to decide a policy. And probably a truth commission should recommend a policy after really studying the issue quite uh, deeply. Needs to recommend a policy on how we're going to deal with secondary occupants. And another thing. One house was owned by one person. Let's imagine that situation in 1948. Today, this person has mm -hmm. 100 grandchildren, or let's say 30 grandchildren, Balash 100, 30 grandchildren. Who gets what? Who gets the house? And who gets compensation for the house? Easy question? Of course it's not an easy question. We need policy. But the policy should be based on a justice principle, generally. But has it been ever done, has it been done anywhere in the world? Is there experience in this? There are experiences, mm -hmm. yes. Where? Uh, like different what? places. For example, um, South Africa is a good example, actually, for restitution of property. They gave, they, in the transitional constitution of South Africa, they introduced a new principle that did not exist in South Africa and does not exist here as well. It's called equality. Mm -hmm. No, no, this is really it has here? No, but you're saying that's the exact <laughs> Yes. Um, so they introduced this in a transitional constitution and under the principle of equality, which is also quite weird, by the way, they introduced the policy on restitution of property, which they returned back to, I think, 1914, when the apartheid system started uh, um, a harder policy of segregation and of taking land from the blacks to give it to the whites, etc. <coughs> um, they put it under the principle of, uh, of, of restitution. Uh, and so they made it constitutional. And not only constitutional, they affiliated it with a new principle that was introduced, which is equality. Which didn't exist. So what, uh, what example? Can you give an example? Of what? Of like specific situations? Yeah, so someone came back to... No, they gave some land. Ah, oh, they gave land. other land. No, no, no the, the same land. The, land. The, the same land. They gave it back. And, and then they would pay compensation to the white owner. Who had to leave? Yes. To the leave the same land, but they have the whole of South Africa that they can move in. It's not that... Uh, but that specific land will return to the owner and compensation will be paid for, but not leave South Africa. Leave that land. And uh, and then manage. Obviously, the distribution of land in South Africa was very unfair at, by the end of the apartheid system. Yeah. Just like it is unfair here. So there needs to be a redistribution of land. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is important. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I know it is not easy. I know that now the distribution of land here is terrible. Israel controls most of the land, there will need to be, if we are seeking justice, we will actually need to return a lot of land. Israel, not we, will have, <coughs> to, ret we have to return a lot of land, um, if justice is sought. 
if we want to continue with the same line, Jewish state, we want to make sure that the Jews have more of most of the land, that's something else. But if we are going to seek justice in the same principles that were followed around the world, we'll have to give land. But then also to manage that, the Jews or the other occupants of the land, they might be Jewish or Arab or whatever, right? That they are also respected, uh, given compensation if, if they should be entitled to such compensation, given the opportunity to purchase land somewhere else. And people will end up coexisting, I believe, I, or I hope. Um, right? Do you have a theory? Because I do. A theory on what? I'm going to ask you about why it worked in South Africa and why it doesn't work here. I don't more, know. There's more land there. They knew apartheid was wrong in South Africa. No. Someone t said to me it was because of the embargo, but that's ridiculous because South Africa is so huge and so so plentiful. There's no way someone can embargo them. The reason that he made the, 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 the switch was because uh, Mandela, Mandela was about to die, and if he died, I mean, all hell would break loose. But the reason I think why it actually worked, and this isn't a small issue, um, the sense of equality, because apartheid also took away all the rights to vote and to own and so on and so forth, um, equality actually brought them to power and brought them to power and gave them the power to rule. That was equivalent to saying to the Palestinians, you have the right to vote. <coughs> of course. Now, but not only that, not only that. When they had the reconciliation, uh, the justice, what do you call it? Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Transitional justice, yes? Yes. Not only the acknowledgement of each other's crimes, so to speak, towards each other, and those who have committed the crime did ask for apology, and those that agreed to accept that apology. That was a huge, huge impact because that is the whole point about satisfaction you, you talk about yes that emotional um, remedy that acknowledgement is is enormous of course it's very important now yes. so so, so uh, also when you talk about giving sort of amnesty of being prosecuted the whole act of being able to do this um, um, this forgiveness act of I'll tell the truth, I will ask for forgiveness and you will agree to give me that forgiveness is based upon the fact that there will be no prosecution. Yeah. And this is about people who live with each other and will have to live together with each other. Yes, that's so there's true. There's an agreement now. That's why prosecute. it's always a discussion. Should we prosecute? Should we give them amnesty? It's, it's a discussion. That's why I also Yes, I know, the time is, uh, is, is running. Um, that's why it's always a discussion, because the people should live together. And in all cases, we need to come up with policies that will help people to live together, on the one hand. But at the same time, from a human rights point of view, from a transitional justice point of view, we need to make sure that there is justice. Now, yes, but, but, but excuse me, um, this is a crucial point. I mean, had, what? I should shut up. We, yes. have, we have to. Uh, <laughs> We have to end. I, w I can I can stay later. Okay. Actually, um, I want to I want to end and I want to share a song. Does everybody <laughs> want to hear a song or not? Yeah. If if yeah. there is objection, then I will not share the song. There is a song. I'm not sure why I want to share it, but uh, it's uh, written by a Palestinian poet <laughs> called uh, um, uh, called Samih um, Al Qasim, uh, and uh, the singer Rim Banna uh, sings it. Uh, it's called I Tell the World, and it has things about the Nakba. I was thinking where is the best place to, to put it in the, in the presentation, and then I ended up put, putting it at the end. Uh, so you read the lyrics, and maybe if I want to highlight anything from the lyrics, I can, or, or we can just end it there, and you, re you, you, know, you, get, uh, you do whatever you want with the lyrics. Um, no, let's hear, let's hear. Yes.
to capture something that um, many of us, uh, including us the lawyers, us the advocates, us the organizations, cannot uh, express. Uh, but it was nicely expressed by uh, this poet. Uh, that he, he expressed things that were lost, you know, the lamp that was broken and the lily that was uh, uh, destroyed. But he also destroyed things that did not happen, uh, a bread that was not baked, like a dough that wasn't baked, uh, and you know, things that should, could have happened naturally and never happened. I feel this is also an expression that maybe we cannot, uh, I cannot, we cannot put into, into maybe, I, I cannot put into legal uh, speech that that I am normally trying to uh, 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 represent, uh, we cannot put it, but it is also something that uh, is felt from an emotional point of view. And uh, we let's, yani, let's hope that eventually, despite the fact that there are things that cannot be returned, reversed uh, uh, totally, but that we can, uh, you know, uh, plant new lilies and, uh, uh, you know, build new houses, build new society that is better. Uh, I, I'm optimistic eventually, not not soon. I don't think this is happening soon, but on the long term, maybe in my life, maybe after my life, inshallah, <laughs> Hashem, it will happen. Uh, so, okay, thank you very much for following, for uh, all of uh, the time you spent, for also the extra 20 minutes today uh, that you gave me, and I will, uh, we, uh, I will share some articles, material, and with you, we'll see a way maybe to put it on a yeah. file, on a cloud file or something that we can share with everybody. Yeah. Um, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks, Mulia, and many thanks to Claude, seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.